Okay, hooray! Awesome, awesome. It says I am live, good to go. <laughs> I am also joined today by Bailey, who uh, decided the moment I sat down on her favorite sofa that she would be joining us today. I will have to dislodge her from my lap shortly in order to actually get some sewing done. But welcome everyone. I haven't done one of these lives, like, a in terms of a public live in about a year. I think it was a year ago that I did it. Um, I did one on shoemaking or something. I do them every month for Patreon, uh, but that's about it. So I haven't done a big one in a while. I'm very excited. Today, hello everyone. Um, today I'm going to be working on the overcoat and I'm mostly gonna be working on the pockets, which are a little bit different than I did for the regular coat. Um, there's actually some front pockets, which is very useful because this is definitely going to be a coat that I actually wear on the regular. So having like front pockets <laughs> rather than just the pockets in the back I gotta like dig into awkward places for um, will be nice because then I can put you know, phone or gloves or things like that in there. So the image that was on the thumbnail is sort of the coat that I'm using as my basis. It's at the Met. Um, and I'll post a comment with a link to that um, afterwards in terms of like the, the regular area. But that is the coat that I'm kind of using as my basis, which is really cool uh, because not only is it a broadcloth, which I do actually have wool broadcloth for this one, hooray. Uh, it has this wonderful little sort of soutache type trim on the edges, which I think is really fun. So I am excited to do that. So Bailey, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to dislodge you from my lap. All right, go on, go, go find your pillow. There you go. Okay, and I will switch over so you guys can actually see what I'm doing because that's kind of helpful. <laughs> Look, I have two cameras. Um, Cause I actually have a streaming camera now <laughs> comparison to when I did this way back a year ago, I did not have a camera that was effective for that. Um, but I also just got the notice that my new camera is shipped out, so that's very exciting. Did I get snow in Reno last night? Um, I don't think we got any snow last night, but we've gotten plenty of snow recently. So there is quite a bit around us. Ah, oh, yes, Susanville, you are not too far away. Okay, so like I said, I'm working with a red wool, broad, red wool broadcloth, fun words, um, and I'm going and lining, so with the pockets, they're not just, they're sort of like a weird sideways welt pocket, but really big. So it's like very show off welt pocket. Um, so I'm putting a silk taffeta um, on the backside of that welt sort of thing. I'm not putting in interfacing or anything like that though. So um, we're going to be starting with that. I am going to get a, I am, I already ordered a fancier silk for the lining for the skirts. So that will be there, but it's not arrived yet because I just ordered it this morning. No, yeah, it's a complete actual live. So feel free to ask questions. I will try to keep up with them the best that I can, as well as continuing to sew. Um, so all I'm doing is folding over the edges of the silk taffeta. And I'm gonna be laying that down on top of the red wool broadcloth just a little bit in from the edge because um, the red wool broadcloth, that's the point of broadcloth, you don't have to actually finish edges. They can be cut edge, but we're gonna do a special treatment to them. So, you guys from all over, this is cool seeing everybody's from. I don't know where no folk in the, where, I don't know how you guys pronounce it in the UK. I know how it's pronounced in Virginia. Um, which is not something I want to say on the air. <laughs> Having lived right by that place, the way that locals pronounced it always got me a good giggle. So, yeah, winter solstice is finally moving back towards slightly sunnier days where we are. It's been quite dark. Uh, yeah, I am. Actually, I've already made one of the shoes. It's not complete, but it's really close. It's very close to being done. I just have some finishing and some things that I want to do to it, and then I have to do the other one. Um, but I got my booster shot <laughs> on Monday, and I am still getting over it, so I needed to do something not shoe-making right now. <laughs> so, yeah. 
shoemaking when your arms are sore. That's my main problem is not the best idea. So I'm just pinning this along. I could baste it. If I wasn't precise about it, I definitely would. Hey, Baltimore. I haven't been to Baltimore in years. Where do I get my inspirations from? Oh gosh, so many places. I spend a lot of time on Pinterest, <laughs> to be truly honest. I feel like that is a good portion of it. Uh, just wandering through and seeing what I like. And there are sometimes events that I need um, things for, but lately that's been less the case. So I get my inspiration from all sorts of places. Yeah. My favorite decade for Victorian. Um, I've been a big fan of like 1890s lately, but that's just my particular love of just the craziness and very tailored look that is that era a particular decade, like the whole range of it. Okay, so I've gotten it pinned along these two edges, the long edge and the short edge. The other edge, this one up here, is actually going to go into the waistband. So I do not need to worry about leaving enough there to fold over. I just need to trim it back. Oh, yay. <laughs> How do I keep from rabbit holing if I'm on a deadline? Um, I'm not very good at not rabbit holing, if you haven't noticed. I just turn it into a whole video if I go too far. <laughs> Um, so I think my idea for doing Gonzo's outfit, uh, if I remember right, came up in October as I was watching, uh, the Muppets Haunted Mansion <laughs> and was like, you know, it'd be really fun to do, like, I, I was just thinking about Gonzo and I was like, I wonder what he wore in that, because it's been a while since I looked at it, you know, it's like, watch it most years, but probably been a year or two. And so I went back and looked at it and was like, that's really fun. Oh man, that gave me a reason to actually do Victorian menswear and I don't normally get to do that. So that's, that was kind of like, oh wait. And then I hemmed and hawed over it for like a couple of weeks and then frantically ordered everything at the end of October. I was like, ah, I waited too long. So, okay, so you do say Norfolk. Okay. See, in Virginia, it's Norfolk. And <laughs> I swear I did not just swear. That's just, that's, that's how it's pronounced, uh, which never makes me not giggle. Um, hey, boosters, what stitch do you use for my buttonholes? I use a buttonhole stitch. I'm actually going to be doing a buttonhole on this. So, <laughs> yes, Constance, drag me into the 1890s. Oh, neat. Lake Tahoe area. Yeah, it's lovely up there. I need to get up there more often. Dream project I want to take on. Um, not really. So as much as I have things that I want to make, I can't really qualify any of them as like a dream project. There are things that I have to plan out further, but I don't really, I don't really make big dreams about stuff because it's about the process and the learning as much as like the actual finished product for me. Um, I don't currently go through a system of sharpening my scissors. These were actually a gift um, from the dinner in New York. So that was part of that. <laughs> yes. Um, so I have a variety of different ones and I certainly can sharpen them. I have the ability to do that. I sharpen my knives constantly. So a jacket with removable sleeves. Yes, they do exist. Um, I don't know if I've seen any specific to that era. I'd have to think about it. Sometimes they have like a, like a cotton muslin almost sort of base thing and that goes on and then the vest bodice goes over it. So the sleeves are attached to a cotton bodicey thing, but that's been about it that I think I've seen that would work for that. But they definitely, definitely exist. I think I've just seen it mostly early 19th century, like Regency sort of things. Neat. Okay, I'm trying to catch up on everybody. <laughs> oh, thigh high leather boots. That sounds like a lot. Like I, I want to get into doing some things like that, but like, oh, that's a big one. Yeah, I have seen Closet Historian, um, her stuff. She, she makes beautiful things. I haven't had a chance to catch up on it, um, but I did recently watch some of her like embroidered bugs and all that sort of stuff, which was really nice to watch. I just haven't had a chance because I've been filming so much to have something on in the background because I have to keep stopping and starting and stopping and starting if I do that. So. <laughs> Norfolk, yeah. <laughs> the whole range of 
different pronunciations. It, the first time I ever heard the uh, difficult pronunciation was when I was flying in to do a job interview there. So <laughs> uh, it was just hilarious to me. Yeah, I actually found red and white striped stock like stockings, like the height that I needed there, and alpaca wool. I found them on Etsy. Um, so I do not have to make those because that's not happening. Um, oh yeah, Wyndham. Um, so yes. Midwestern accent. Oh, that interesting. Yeah, so Steen, gorgeous stuff. I need to find something to work with her on in terms of embroidery. I just haven't had I haven't usually been planning out far enough to get a thing figured out with her to actually have the embroidery done. I do actually have an, my sewing machine does work as an embroidery machine, so I could run the embroidery. I've tried doing embroidery designs myself before. I do not like them. Um, I do not like doing them. I've done it. It just takes me too much time. She's fortunate that like she's got a lot of sitting and waiting downtime um, she can do on a computer with her job, so I just... I, I, um, so what I am currently, you guys have a lot of things, characterized as lost material? Probably. Um, I'll have to think on that one. Um, this is, I think I've heard people call it a slip stitch before for me. So this is really interesting. I'll try to kind of like get you guys closer. So because I'm working with a broadcloth, which is, which is like super thick, I can actually make sure that I'm not going all the way through the fold part. And I'm sort of like carrying my stitch through, it goes technically underneath the woven part of the fabric, but it won't go through to the exterior. Um, and I will carry that through and then come up and do that. So you'll hear it called a felling stitch. Um, the slip stitch thing I think is more of a 20th century term. And so what you get on the exterior there is a pretty much invisible stitch, um, but just a little bit of a visible one on the inside. So that's what I'm currently doing based off of the original that I'm trying to copy from the Met, because uh, there are no visible stitches on the exterior portion like that. So, yeah. Well, yeah, sleeves could also be tied on, but that's that's a much, like, I generally see that much earlier, like up through the 17th century. Um, Discworld books, I have not read any Discworld books. Uh, favorite fashion movie, I don't know. I I don't rewatch movies a lot. There's only a few movies that I'm like really into rewatching, one of which is Lord of the Rings, um, and that is my Christmas plans. <laughs> it's just to put on the extended cut and just not do anything all day. It's gonna be great. Um, yeah, new shoes for this, definitely. They're, they're coming along. Um, interestingly enough, the shoes are the one thing that will, to me at least, be pretty dramatically different than what Gonzo has, because um, as I will talk about in that video, it's the one thing the movie did pretty wrong. <laughs> Her costume is the least accurate. So I've actually already done an 1870s embroidered corset, but it no longer fits me. And I think I gave it to a friend. I think I gave it to Maggie. That makes sense. Um, the, the gold cotton that I use for the pocketing, <laughs> um, that comes from a local source. It's vintage. Uh, so it's new old stock and it's just from a, a local place that sells that. You can get similar-ish stuff uh, from Needle and Thread in Gettysburg. That's the only place I know of that sells it modern made. Um, you can get cotton sateen that has some similarities and maybe even glaze it yourself if you want to. Um, I think Renaissance Fabrics has a good cotton sateen. So yeah, I wish I used my uh, embroidery part of my machine more. It just takes so much time to set up and take down. So. Jane Austen corsets. Um, look into Red Threaded. She has patterns and I mean, she produces the actual corsets as well. So you can buy those as is, but definitely like she has really good patterns and information and there are a bunch of other people that have started to get into that era as well, um, selling patterns and things. I spend a lot of time on, when I'm trying to find people, Instagram um, for certain eras, just kind of wander through from there. So many questions. Um, Cause they're doing the early time period for costume. Yeah, I'd like to move further back. Um, I started something 15th century. I definitely want to do more 16th century. I'm not sure how much further I'll get back from there, but I would like to extend pretty far on both sides. 
the, the lamp that is behind me, this is an antique. I have a matching pair of them and I made the lampshade for it. So, <laughs> so I can't really help you with that. I have a lot of antiques in my house um, because uh, when I lived in Virginia, there were a lot of antique stores, but interestingly enough, the Victorian stuff in early 20th century, which is some of my favorite, like late 19th, early 20th century, was really cheap because that just wasn't popular in 18th century land, <laughs> as it were. So yeah, everybody's got good plans for Christmas. I, I will look into this world. I've heard of it before. I just... I've been so bad about reading lately. It used to be that I would always read on vacations, but obviously I haven't really been on a vacation in a long time. Oh, neat. Little Earth Rangers form. Oh, cool. I have a friend who's really into that sort of stuff. Oh, look into that. More shoemaking. Yeah, that'll be the next video. Next week's video will be shoemaking. Yeah. Oh, good night. Yep, this will, this, this whole thing will go up after I'm done with it and I'm thinking tomorrow might be earlier, but we'll see. I almost never use a thimble. That's why I'm not using a thimble. Um, I don't, I don't push this way. I grip and push. So a thimble just gets in the way and actually uh, tends to ruin my thread really fast. Now I've got myself all cut up in my stitch. Who knew? There we go. So I just don't normally use a thimble. I didn't learn with one. Um, I started sewing when I was really, really little and probably could not have found a thimble to match. Tailoring for your body type. Oh God, there's so much information there, man. Um, I don't even know where to begin with that. <laughs> I think that's why I'm just doing as many videos on it as I can. Um, there are just different eras that are more forgiving or less forgiving as I found, depending on your body type, but yeah, Renaissance Fabrics currently has some. It works for... Yeah, all of the costumes in that movie are so good. Like, they actually really show the transition of time very well. So... Yay, I'm glad tailoring videos have helped. Have I ever made any 1950s shoes? I don't think I've gone that late yet, because I haven't really had a need to, because there's so many people that do reproductions once you reach the 40s, 50s, so I haven't had the same need. But maybe I will. Maybe. Oh, I know, audiobooks. The problem is, the issue for me with any sort of noise is that if I am currently filming, which is the vast majority of my day, because um, lately I gotta cram it into the sunlight hours, that I can't have noise going because I'm gonna have to stop it every like five minutes to film another section. So, yeah. Crafts that I don't do, but would like to try. Oh man, so many. Uh, <laughs> everything? <laughs> That's my problem. <laughs> I, I would like to learn more about metalworking. Um, that would be nice. Metalworking of some type would definitely be good. I feel like that would be useful. And more 3D stuff, I like in terms of 3D printing, I feel like that would be incredibly useful for what I do. Which doesn't seem hard. I've done stuff like 3D modeling digitally before. It was just so long ago. Ooh, um, can your knuckles? I don't know. I'm really bad about that. I have so much damage on my hands right now. <gasps> um, Hampton Roads. Uh, Williamsburg stuff is great. There, uh, just go to the antique mall to start. And there is a little shop right in front of the antique mall, like as the entrance uh, in Williamsburg to the antique mall. Um, is, I can't remember what they're called now, but I love, they, they have great stuff. They're really sweet. Um, but yeah, I just usually did all the antique stores around Williamsburg because there's so, so many. Historical shoemakers. Um, Sean Picard is a friend of mine that does, he does men's 18th century shoemaking and he's just amazing at it. Um, just a lot of people that do historical shoemaking, um... Like, they don't post about it that much. There's, I think, a few people in Europe that do it. If I do lives more, I will definitely eventually look into getting a mod of some type for right now. This, like, I'd like to do more lives, but it required 
Um, this is the first one I've done in so long. I had no idea like how many people I would end up with or anything, which is kind of fun to just like, I have no idea. So yeah. Will I be dying my hair anytime soon? I mean, I do every time. It's just a little bit different every time. I don't know if you can see. It's a little bit reddish right now. So. Ooh, Stone Age fashion, interesting. Do I make my own bags? No, I haven't made my own like purse sort of thing since college. I did one of those way back when. 3D printer. Um, I would like to start utilizing 3D modeling and 3D printing more in shoemaking in the sense of being able to design and test out lasts and heels and then send them off to actually be produced without having to carve all that stuff myself. So that would be a really effective use of that. Um, but again, it just takes a little bit more time. Disney accurate costumes definitely will be at some point. <laughs> if for no other reason than Disney, I feel like owns nearly all content at this point. Uh, so <laughs> just about everything is a Disney accurate costume if you think about it. So yeah, moving along, lots of little stitches, not visible though on the uh, exterior. Oh, thanks. I didn't see the bot, so it's not showing up on my end. I wonder, wonder why. If I could dress like a famous person. Oh, I don't know. I'm really bad <laughs> at keeping track of famous people. It'd probably be like Catherine Hepburn or something way back like that. Like, that's about it. Um... I think most of my ideal, unfortunately, most of my like ideal era of fashion tends to be late teens, early 20s, and there aren't as many people from that era that are as well known. Um, I can't remember who it is. There's some woman who dresses in a mix of both men's and women's attire, and I really love her stuff. So, oh, hi! Hi, Dawn! How are you? I haven't talked to you in forever. Yeah, selling 3D printed lasts on Etsy. That makes sense. Um, I'm like, I am really determined to stick with wood lasts for the most part, but there is a place that I know that is able to take, like, this is a model and they will reproduce it in wood for me. So, percentage of my clothing and shoes. It used to be like 75 to 90%. Um, I have bought a lot more clothing in the last few years because uh, I haven't been out wearing nice stuff all the time. So it's ended up being less fancy clothing. I make, I, cause I make a lot of suits and those are not really practical. So <laughs> like, I want to get back into doing that more, but I'm definitely trying to make it so I've got more shoes. That's one of my big goals for the next year and make it so that way when I go on trips, I have most of the stuff made by me. So that's definitely the, the, long-term goal that I'm working towards, especially this year. Most challenging part of a project. It's the point where I think I know everything and then I go to start making it and go, I know nothing and freak out. There's just like all of this project. So these pockets are going to be sort of, probably sort of a good way to explain this, the front pockets. So they're kind of at like the front hip area at an angle vertically. So this is just one of the weird little welty pocket flap type things. It, it's more like a giant welt than a pocket flap. Oh, you met Catherine Ever. Neat, I love her. So 3D is on my, my future list, but it probably won't be this year. It'll probably be like next year or something. It, I know it's advancing so fast in terms of what is available and what is affordable and all of that, so. Pajama set project. I've done some like that before. I actually have uh, original like 1930s um, pajama set still hanging around somewhere. I'm, it's on my list of things to give away to people. Modern day equivalent of a dandy. I don't know other than I think they're still calling themselves dandies in a lot of ways. Like I know quite a few people that I self identify as dandies. So I think it still fits. Um, highly recommend uh, Rose Callahan did an entire book on the modern dandy where she went and did photography and interviews um, with a whole bunch of gentlemen who uh, identify as that sort of thing. So that was the kind of threads that I've been using. Pretty much all silk. I'm currently using a fairly thin silk 
uh, for this part because I don't want it to be visible, but I also have a sort of mid weight and buttonhole weight that I've been varying between all of. So both 30, 50 and buttonhole. Jackie Kennedy. Um, I appreciate her style, but I also hate the fact that she was like one of the death knells for hats. I've also had to make Jackie Kennedy suits for a very weird theatrical production, and that was... I, I just will never quite unsee how they were used in that production. <laughs> we're not going to get into that. If you've ever seen that play, you know... <laughs> you know what it is. <laughs> um, and I don't remember the name of it, sadly. Thank you, Dana! Dana, Dana, Dana. I don't know what she is. Also, yay, little corn corgi puppy. Um... <laughs> How do I store all of my costumes? So I have two different ways. They are either hanging in a very large closet that I have, uh, thankfully, or they actually get stored flat in archival boxes. It just depends on whether I need to get to access them regularly or not, and whether they actually are good at hanging or not. So how far down the rabbit hole? Um, I like to think of most of my rabbit hole work as I'm writing a grad school paper, not a thesis. <laughs> like, this would be a good five to eight page paper if I needed it to be. I kind of can tell about at what point I have enough content for half an hour and then like, so gotten pretty good at that, thankfully. Yeah, yeah I've been really enjoying doing more like masculine presenting clothing as we think of it, because it's also, as you do it historically, gets you to realize how our concept of what is men's clothing versus women's clothing and how we define it is dramatically changing all the time. So I really enjoy like what, what is the ideal look of the period and it being so different than what we would think. Have I made any knitted or crocheted shawls? Shawls? I don't think. I have, maybe as a kid. I don't know. I've been knitting and crocheting for a very long time as well. I've done plenty of sweaters, um, but I don't tend to do shawls as much. Yeah, making a waistcoat with something that laces up the back is really common. Uh, even for 18th century, a lot of times it'll split up the center back and not actually be stitched together. Thanks, Elizabeth! Um, and... <laughs> So that is a really common thing that makes it adjustable and there's just different types of adjustment in the back for different time periods, whether it's a buckle or lacing strips or the actual back is laced up. Um, but I have also found with waistcoats and the nice thing is even if you do dramatically change sizes, a lot of times you just have to take out the back and put a new one in. Oh, you guys just hanging out is enough. That's, that's the point. Everybody's here. <laughs> the more successful this is, the more uh, YouTube will, like in terms of people hanging out and ch chatting with me, the more YouTube will be like, hey, other people want to see this later. So, no, that's always good. Bigger boy cap. Oh, that'd be fun. I, don't know, I haven't made that sort of thing before. Favorite Muppets character. Um, it used to be Animal. Um, but I am finding, not surprisingly, a strong affinity towards Gonzo lately. <laughs> so, yeah. So I'm not sure if I have a particular one other than that. Come as a start, a 19 teen suit. Awesome! It is such a good era. I just purchased another 1900s bodice and... Did I get something 19 teens? No, I got an 1890s jacket. Oh, to, that'll be fun. I'm excited to share that with people. Um, for 1800 women's pants. I really, now that I'm spending more time in like the 1830s, 1840s, I came across um, that one image of a woman in trousers out hunting. And like, I just keep looking at going, that'd be really fun to make. So I don't know, maybe I will. Maybe I will do some, I, I need to spend some more time on like that. What type of clothing did I start with? Um, I've been sewing since I have memory, so I'm not sure what I started with. I probably started with doll clothing and stuffed animals. Um, in terms of making stuff for myself, I I couldn't even begin to figure out where it was. Do I snip the salvages of the wool? Sometimes. 
for pre-shrinking. Um, no, I don't tend to pre-shrink my wool too much. That's more useful if you're planning on getting things consistently, like, dry cleaned, and there's likely to be shrinkage. Would I... Sh oh my goodness. Thank you. Um, would you show here or in a video a little tutorial on the back stitch that looks the same for both sides? Yeah, I can definitely do more on that. Um, I don't think I will be on this one because it's a little weird, but um, I can do like a little uh, drawing of that that I can post on Instagram. That would be probably the easiest way to explain it <laughs> rather than just showing it. Because I was thinking about it, I'm like it's a little weird to it's a little weird to explain. Um, I get why it's confusing to people because it's like a spaced back stitch but on an angle but yeah I can totally do a little drawing for that and put that up on Instagram and that'll make sense so yeah, I'm glad you guys are learning so much but oh so many questions Syrah um I don't know a lot about Syrah I've come across it a few times but I don't think I currently have any and you go this way um, I did recently find a great source for really fancy silks. Um, Kamaluchi or something? I can't remember the exact name. So, But I will post about their stuff once I get some more in. Um, one of the projects I do want to do, and I hesitate to call anything a dream project just because I feel like that puts way too much emotional value into like things, and I don't I don't find it healthy when people are like, "This is my dream project." Like I, for me personally, it is not a healthy thing to do. Um, so I generally avoid that stuff. But I try to catch up on everything. So many questions. I'm sorry if I miss things. Um, trying to keep up as best I can. You guys are active. I love it. I love that you guys have so many fun questions. How am I able to make a living out of this? Huh. Um, by putting it on YouTube. That is, <laughs> I, I've done. So in my past lives, <laughs> as it were, um, I did run a business for a number of years making historic clothing for people and I made it like some money off of it, but there's only so much that you can. Um, just because people can only afford so much and there's a limitation to that and you're constantly doing work in order to make any money. Um, and the, when I started doing shoes, I did the math as to whether I could afford that, like as a job for my life to make shoes for other people. And it just wasn't, um, going to be feasible without so much work. So that was quickly knocked down and then eventually came around to this being a viable option, um, which most of the viability when it comes to dealing with YouTube comes from the fact that once you reach a certain point of um, viewers and things like that, you are able to get sponsorships. And I know it's annoying to have like a minute or two at the beginning of videos where I talk about something, uh, though some of those things like I'm really actually very excited to talk about um, a lot of the like uh, streaming services and things like that have been really fun to get to do. Um, but that's, that makes it very viable for me. So, oh goodness. What's my dog doing? Dog is great. Bailey is good. Yes, we know what happens with dream projects. Yeah, like for me, the reason I do these things isn't to have the final product. I mean, sometimes like I'm making something for a purpose and whatever, um, but my main thing is to learn stuff to learn and share that. Um, so that way other people can do more things with their product, like projects. And um, so that way, you know, we can learn. Sometimes it helps you understand the past better and all sorts of things. So yeah. So like, that's the reason why I do what I do is to, for the process as much as the actual finished product. Um, just cause I get to learn all of that, so. Modern fabrics not holding up as well. Um, I would like to do more like actual scientific research into that in terms of trying to wear things out. Like they definitely had finer threads because you can, um, when you're working threads by hand, you can feel the bumps a lot better than machinery can. So that's one of the reasons why they could do much finer versions of things. So sustainable fabric stores. I know there are, but I am awful at remembering names. Um, so, and I don't spend as much time there as possible. A lot of it's just uh, finding, I do a lot of shopping on Etsy of vintage and historic, like antique fabrics, that really helps. 
in terms of knowing that I'm using stuff that would otherwise, you know, not be, not, not like going way back with those things, but. Oh, neat. Best tailoring videos. Wow. I need to spend more time looking at like other people's tailoring content. Oh, don't chew your paw, honey. <laughs> so. Oh, neat. Yeah, that'd be fun to see more on weaving. Chevoid cloth? Interesting. I don't know. I don't know that one. I haven't come across that term before. Um, okay, so taking a moment, I am currently starting to stitch on what just is the like double soutache braids. Um, this one's rayon. It's vintage, but it's really good quality. So it honestly looks a fair bit like silk. And the way that I'm doing this, it's really weird. And it took me a long time to figure this out on the original. Um, so it looks visible as just one part there and full on the back side. Um, I'm actually coming up midway through the fabric. So on the back side, I'm taking a stitch that actually catches the silk just for extra security. And then I'm coming up through the edge of the wool. So therefore you won't actually see the stitch on the exterior. It's sort of, it catches the weave, but it's underneath the fulling. Of course I get a big knot right as I do that. And then I go through the midway point of the soutache. So I'm doing this weird little hidden stitch that ends up with a finished format that you don't actually visibly see stitching on the exterior with. So that's one of those fun things that I've been <laughs> trying to figure out with this because I've been staring at the images of the original so much lately trying to figure it out. Um, yeah, fabric is definitely the hard part. This pattern, collar at the cleavage. So here, so it's standing away here. What that means is that you have to think of it like putting in a dart. So your dart on your pattern, and you can do this literally on your pattern, just put in a dart there and it will shift your shoulder over. So that's how you take care of that um, gapping at the neck. So that's the first thing you can do. You can also put in like tailor's tape or something to kind of like hold it in a little snugger. But yeah, literally, like on your pattern, you put a dart in and kind of adjust the neckline shape a little bit. So that that is the most common issue <laughs> that I have found over the years um, dealing with like women's garments, men's garments, anything for uh, bodies that have fuller chests. Like it's just gonna gap at the neck. So. How do I, how do you research areas that you're not in? Uh, that is the question, man. Like, I wish I had an answer for that one. There's so much stuff that I wish I could research, but finding it, especially if you don't speak that language, really difficult. Um, I'd like to do more regional research, but just there's so much limitation on that. It's one of the reasons why, unfortunately, you know, America England and France tend to be the ones that get studied the most because most of it's online and accessible and easy to find in English language, even the French stuff. So, yep, that, that is a very difficult thing. Go into academic text and books. I want to write more academic stuff. I really do. I want to start doing articles because um, basically most of the videos that I've done have enough research in them to be a proper academic article. Everything's got citations already. <laughs> so I totally could. And at some point I will just start mass uh, putting those into like, you know, Costume Society of America and things like that. So definitely. What are you trying to do, babe? You want down? Oh, there you go. Okay. How can I sew and talk? It's more the sewing and reading that's the hard part. I can sew and talk just fine. It's catching up with all of the comments and questions. That's the more difficult part. I can sew and talk. Um, Cause that was my job for a long time when I worked at Williamsburg. <laughs> if I didn't know how to do it before, I definitely learned how to then. I had a dream about that last night. That was really weird. I just remembered that. Whew. I have very strange dreams about that place. 
That was just weird because I was back in the shop and was just like left there. Like, okay, you you just got back. You can interpret again. I'm like, no, I don't remember what I'm doing. <laughs> don't leave me. <laughs> um, and horizontal darts above the bust, um, like right above the bust point, is actually something that you do see historically in a lot of garments, including vests, by the way. Um, if you cannot manage to put one in there, it's another reason why the dart, the vertical dart here is done because it does the same thing. It pulls it out so you can, if you need to do a, a vertical dart there and that should help. Um, but then it just takes changing how it attaches to the back point. So. I have a very slow old dog. Um, she's 12, she's not that old, but like, She's 12, so she's not getting into my stuff too much. And she's never been prone to like eating pins or anything too crazy. So I haven't, I haven't worried about that. You don't have a dummy to put a mock-up on. Um, I rarely use it. It pretty much is a fancy hanger for me. Um, so I do most of my work without a mannequin. So I don't find it to be necessary. You can though pad out a hanger a lot. I do recommend that um, just to be able to like hang stuff and let it weigh itself down and stretch out or to kind of visually like walk back across the room, just pad out a hanger a bunch. Um, that's definitely a good option. Video, well, do I think that academia will have to start accepting video format essays? I don't know. Um, it's really hard. <laughs> I say this doing it all the time. It's really hard to cite your sources as it were um, when it comes to that sort of stuff. So in video format, I find it very difficult and I've not really been satisfied with the way that I do it. So it's definitely something that I don't think will happen anytime soon, but they're so closely related, like the way that Abby does it. So fun fact, um, I improv freehand, however you want to term it, all of my videos. I do not write a script. Um, I sometimes write an outline, sometimes, usually not. So I just talk. Um, I make sure that I understand what I'm talking about well enough and I just talk and I will sometimes have like a few notes here and there about like specific things. But um, yeah, so Abby on the other hand writes everything out and so she basically already has an article. <laughs> if I just started doing something more like that, um, I could just turn into an article really fast. But Progressive Taylor, yeah, they have tons of women's stuff in Progressive Taylor. Um, I've drafted a few things out of there. I'm not sure I've made any of the drafts up here yet. So definitely um, that. Darts near boning. Sometimes boning is on darts. Um, just depends on the, the era and the style. Yeah. Oh yeah, especially if you're able to do a collar, because um, if you could dart it and then extend the collar out and then over or something like you could hide it piecing or some stuff like that. So there's, if, if there's gaps anywhere, so you got to think of it like your bust point, um, you're dealing with a mountain and in order to make a mountain out of a piece of paper, you got to put a dart somewhere. It's going to, otherwise it's going to be too flat and gappy somewhere. So if everything's super fitted, but you haven't put in a large enough dart, whether it's a bunch of them or one big one, um, you will have a flat section. You will have a section that does not hit the ground. It stands out from the ground. So you just got to put a dart somewhere around. <laughs> it doesn't matter where. Anywhere around is fine uh, if you've already made the garment. Um, the, the issue that is like gapping here can be dealt with up here with like a dart um, that's not vis like in the pattern, not the actual clothing. But yeah, so you just got to think of it like that. Was I always comfortable with talking to camera? Um, I did theater a lot ever since I was very young. Theater and singing and dancing and other things. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> I had people tell me recently like, oh, you seem so much more comfortable in your videos now than you used to be. Um, I haven't gone back to watch my own videos. Maybe I do seem less uh, confident or whatever, but I don't feel anymore. So <laughs> it feels pretty much the same. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, I never had issues in like speech class or anything like that. So aside from when they're like, you have to write this out exactly. I'm like, but I just want to talk. So 
video on lace and buttons. I definitely want to do a video on fasteners, the history of fasteners. Um, I don't know enough about lace. I wish I knew more, but most of it's just like, I can look at something and tell you when it's from, but that's not really <laughs> effective. Yeah, I just make everything up as I go. It's fun. Sometimes they're just adorable little, you know, hills, it's fine. But I mean, that's kind of the point, like all of your lumps and bumps have to be figured in much the same way, so. What range do I sing in? Um, I used to do mostly soprano. Um, I did a lot of second as well, just because I don't find singing um, parts difficult. I don't, so I got put into second, not necessarily because of range, but because of like, you know, it's high school. You're not gonna, some people are better off just singing harmony melody sort of like just simple melody and not neither color alterations for dresses um what i recommend for dealing with collars um is take a scrap piece of fabric muslin whatever cut a rectangle just a nice long rectangle as big as you want your collar to be and put it on you, the dress form, whatever it is, and start taking in darts around the neck area um, to get the shape and curve that you want. And once you've taken in all these tiny little darts the whole way around, lay it out flat with those darts still pinned in, and there's your collar pattern. That's, that's what I do when I'm in a pinch. <laughs> and then you start to see what curve in what area, how it affects all of that. So that definitely helps. Line of stitching on the front of a blouse from mid stomach to breast of dart. Attaching things like collagen cups. There's so many ways to do that. I don't know. There's a whole variety. I mean, whether you're putting a lining in or machine versus hand. Oh, there's. This is why I like spend a lot of time. Um, being like, all right, we're gonna do this way, we're gonna try that way, we're gonna try something else. Am I on Instagram? Yes, under a completely different name, but there should be a link um, in the description of like all of my videos or on my um, like personal, like my video page on YouTube, there should be links to that um, rather than me trying to spell it out. I tried to change yeah, there you go. Um, I tried to change, I think, I can't remember if it's that or that with underscores. I don't know. Um, I tried to change it to something more logical recently, but most of the things with my actual name are taken, so <laughs> I have limited options. <laughs> How do I get over my fear of cutting into fabric? Um, what I tend to do, I don't get a lot of fear of it because I've done so much stuff. What I tend to do um, is I will take one day and get everything chalked out and marked out make sure I get this down here, on the time on the fabric and then I will walk away <laughs> and come back to it another day <laughs> before I cut anything out and then like it'll come to me in the middle of the night and be like oh I forgot to put allowance on that or oh I meant to do that or, like sometimes just walking away for like a few hours or a day is really helpful so that helps my dog is asleep on the floor somewhere over there <laughs> Um, there, yeah, straight fabric and dealing with darts and straight fabric, definitely a hard one. Um, but there are, there are options. I'm trying to think of like, would be best way. I don't know. My favorite era to sew. Um, I want to spend more time in 1900s in terms of all of the tiny detail work, like soutache and tailoring and all of that. But I don't know. I mean, I really enjoy the eras where I have to hand stitch everything. <laughs> Surprisingly, um, I've done too much 18th century to care for that one anymore.
good substitute for wool. It depends on what sort of qualities you need out of it, because there are many things that are meant to mimic wool, like acrylic and polyester can do very good jobs, but they mimic it in different ways. So it depends on what you need. So my mock-ups tend to hang out in a bin for a while until I've changed size to the point where it's no longer useful, uh, because what I will do is, if it's say Ben, if I say have a pair of trousers and it's been like three or four years since I made that pair of trousers, but I need to make something similar. It allows me to double check some things from the mock-up. So sometimes the mock-ups just keep getting reused for that purpose or I'll make some alterations to them. Um, they sometimes, the ones that have bigger pieces get cut back apart. But I mean, that's why I choose to go with unbleached muslin, not just because it's inexpensive, but also because it's much less processed it's not a qual it's not a fiber quality that um, they specifically go for so it's like leftover bits so it's not as chemically impactful because uh, it isn't bleached it isn't colored it's not uh, it's sort of like off cuts in a way so it is the least environmentally impactful textile option um, that I can go with aside from going and like buying old sheets or something uh, which I just don't get out to do <laughs> so what point did fashion magazines transition um pretty late in the 20th century to be honest so it it, it comes with the like casual wear vibes of the 1970s and that sort of thing like that's when you really start to see a change um, also, when people started wearing a lot more of their personal stuff or just casual things. Why did I get into shoes? Because my feet are weird um, and I couldn't find any shoes that were comfortable to wear for when I was working at Colonial Williamsburg. Um, and since I was walking a lot, it was a problem. <laughs> So fortunately, someone I knew was teaching a workshop, and so I took that workshop, and the rest is history. Uh, um, more in the 1930s fashion. Yeah, I love 1930s. I used to wear almost entirely 1930s. Like, I have a massive closet's worth of 1930s stuff, uh, most of which does not fit me anymore. I will probably do more of that in the future. Um, I've just been into, like, early 20s stuff more. So I don't know. I'm not good at, I'm not a good person to recommend patterns. Um, drafting manuals I use, but I honestly could not tell you the last time I used a commercial pattern. How do I keep my hands looking so nice? <laughs> they do not. <laughs> I would show you all of the problems with them right now. Um, here's a good one. Um, yeah, that part of my pinky has been rubbed off from shoemaking. <laughs> Almost all of my fingers have a problem right now. So, yeah. Um, the only fabric store I go to locally is Mill End, and that's the one that's all, like, vintage and old stock. Like, stuff that's just leftovers. Um, that's where I get a lot of my stuff from for random things, but I don't go very often. I tend to go when we have people visiting. Fabric 101 about synthetics. I want to at some point. I just haven't had a chance to fit it into the schedule. Um, so maybe in the spring at some point. Oh, I could turn it into paper. That'd be pretty cool. I haven't done that in forever. To that lake, probably like elementary school or something. <laughs> Um, I will always put preference in seeing originals over just pictures. Um, but I know it is not feasible for a lot of what I do. This is turning out really nice, you guys. It's so pretty. It's such a nice, like, pretty clean edge. But it's just a little flash of fun. Um, so I will always try to get into museums as much as possible. It just hasn't been as possible since I started my channel. Ah. It's also why I started collecting antique shoes. Um, I have a lot now. I will be showing off that collection on a video some point in your future. I have a few more eras to collect, and then it's gonna be this great little timeline 
of 19th century and 20th century. Um, this is pretty much like it, it was my hobby before I could do a job. Um, and then I went to college for uh, theater, technical theater. And then immediately out of college, took a job at Colonial Williamsburg um, in the background doing the more costumey part of stuff. And it just kind of kept going from there. So I've never really taken the moment to go, I want to do this for a living. It just kind of happened that way. Because um, I didn't really do this as a hobby. I did it as a living. And then it became also my hobby. So, yeah. Um, recommend for people wanting to get into making shoes. Start with modern things. I Like the shoemaking kit video had some good options um, in terms of like kits you can try and all that sort of stuff. But gradually work yourself into it with modern stuff rather than historic. Um, I'm finding it really difficult to go the other way. On knits. I do want to do a video on knitting. Um, don't know about knit fabrics. Yeah, good leather. Oh, yeah, good. Cutting into good leather is way scarier than fabric. <laughs> Can't agree there. It's so much more expensive. Once you start having to order leather, suddenly fabric seems cheap. Even the really outrageous stuff. <laughs> How do I find antique garments? Um, mostly witchy vintage. <laughs> Once you buy enough from her, she puts you on a special list where you get to see things in her Instagram friends only stories and you get first dibs and oh no, it's a, it, it is a dangerous thing. That's where I get most of my stuff from. I also have um, a few other antique dealers um, on Instagram that I've gotten to know and sometimes reach out to me when they have like one recently. It was like, I have a bunch of shoes. Would you like some? Yes. So advice about adapting patterns to fit different shaped bodies without messing up the proportions and shapes of the period. Um, oh, that's a big complicated one. I think if there's anything I can like throw out that would be recommendations on that. Um, because obviously in the era they had plenty of not ideal body shapes as well, like that most people would have been. Um, but they do a lot of padding out in order to accommodate that. So like no different than when you're dealing with any pattern at any point in time, the recommendation is always to start with the biggest part and then you can bring things in easier than you can let things out. Um, so like corsets and bodices and things like that, I will generally make to the right size and then fill out as needed in different spaces because that's what they would have done as much as anything else. They don't expect your body to change. They don't expect the clothing to change. They just negotiate between the two with padding. I mean, I have seen some pretty dramatic like pattern adjustments to clothing. Um, one of the things that Abby has is just, it, this really amazing um, garment that is very uneven. It's really cool. And at some point I know we're going to do, like she's going to do a video on that. I can't wait to see it. Um, but hobby interest that I enjoy unrelated to historical costuming. Um, uh, I wish I had more time for things. I love languages. I love music. Um, I learned how to play the ukulele a while back and I'm sure I've forgotten most of it. <laughs> See what other things, I obviously like collecting antiques. That's only somewhat related. Um, interior design, house stuff, architecture. Uh, I've loved that for a long time. Dance, I really love dance. That's a good one. There you go. That's a thing that is not directly related. Sometimes can be helpful, but not directly related at all. I love dance of all types, so. Yeah, Paul Hunter stories are dangerous. Oh yeah, quilted petticoats. Yeah, there's some pre-quilted stuff out there you can find. Tailoring modern clothing to appear more vintage. Hmm. Um, I've definitely done that before in a theatrical sense, but I'm not sure I've done it up close. Um, but I would think simple things like changing where the darts, how much the darts take up, um, the curve of the side seams, changing out buttons. Um, and accessories makes a big difference. Just so like changing a bit of the fit and then maybe putting more padding, like you can get the uh, shoulder pads that are already pre-done and like add those if you want more of a 1930s, 40s style. Um, 
But for me, when I was really into dressing vintage back in like college, I didn't have a lot of money or a bunch of time to make everything. I just accessorized the heck out of it. Like add a hat, it looks vintage. Um, so I definitely was very reliant on accessorizing um, all of my modern stuff as much as possible. Adapting patterns for different body shapes. Yeah, so that, again, that's what I'm trying to slowly kind of show people. I definitely want to do more um, instructional things. I, I think I've talked about this somewhere, like an Instagram live or something. Um, one of the things I think I'm going to do more next year, if I can manage it, um, is to sort of put a lot more instructional stuff on my Patreon. Um, because there's more that I want to do, but those videos don't tend to do very well on large scale, but I want to be able to do them and provide people with that information. Um, so that might end up being more reliant heavily on Patreon to do more instructional, like, okay, how do you do this for a pocket or how do you adjust for this or like fitting issues or whatever. So that's definitely on my list, um, of things to do in the future. I just need to figure out the best way to do it so I can get a whole bunch of detailed videos on that. How do I store my antique shoes? I have some weird shelves that they live on that used to be their antique um, and they used to be for sheet music and they're perfect to be able to fit two pairs of shoes per. Um, so that's currently how they live, but I need to go through and properly um, do a whole bunch of stuff. I have the supplies, I just haven't had the time to go through, care, like hydrate, care for them, stuff them, all of that. I miss dance too, man. Like, ugh. Oh, hi, Elizabeth. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> when you put a lot of labor into something, it is very often worth the investment on the materials. You will thank yourself later. And it's like, it's not always possible, but I honestly would rather do fewer projects and do them with better materials and take more time. Um, and that, that's definitely what I try to do. Uh, I could speed sew these things. I'm very fast if I want to be, but dream house. Um, I want an old house, like a late Victorian, like 1880s, 1890s. I mean, I'm also super big on Art Nouveau. It's just hard to find over here. So. Um, I have worked with real fur, mostly vintage stuff. Um, the problem with like older stuff is it gets dry and brittle. So that's what you got to watch out for. There's very little you can do about that. One of the reasons I don't use actual fur too much just because it's so difficult. Oh yeah. And 70s for, yeah, 80s for 40, like 1980s does 1940s, 1970s does 1930s, um, and a little bit of 20s. Yeah, we repeat stuff a lot. Oh, yeah. Yeah, finding free crochet knitting. And there are definitely, um, if you want to find earlier ones, yeah, before 1840s, the reason why you won't find it before 1840s is because they didn't. So like knitting stockings, yes, but knitting a sweater, no. <laughs> it just isn't. That's one of the reasons why I like the knitted or crocheted like shawl thing is very much a mid 19th century thing. Like it's just not around at all before then. Like there are knit stockings and you will find knit fabrics that they made things out of earlier than that, but it's not common. Like it wasn't a, it wasn't a hobby that people did, so. Because if you don't, the reason why modern pockets are made out of garbage materials is because you don't see them and most people don't bother with their hands in this stuff. So they just, they get away with the cheap stuff and places you can't see it. And speaking from somebody who did ha, like dealt with production issues, that's the sort of thing where you're going to get a sample and it's going to be good. And, but unless you really specify it has to be this, they will short you. Um, on that in the actual final production lines. You have to be very specific about everything. Otherwise they will find places where they can use slightly less expensive options any which way, which it's understandable. They're trying to save money. Like that's the point. So. 
I do. Oh, why, how long would I spend in one of my favorite eras? Uh, like, I don't know, maybe a week? I feel like it just depends on... <laughs> like, I don't want to spend very long there. I feel like a day is good. Go experience some things. I don't know Darcy clothing at all. I have not, I have not made it to their stuff yet. Oh, I can't speak to that. Um, oh, that I've seen. Oh. I don't know. There's a really cool one in uh, Portugal. <laughs> I got to see that it was really neat. And I it was like this, it was this beautiful, it was meant to be like a museum, but it was very weird. It didn't have much in it, but it was this beautiful Art Deco townhouse um, and gorgeous big, sh just, loft filled with windows and skylights. Ugh. Um, yeah, I mean, you're going to see knitting earlier than that, but in terms of knitting patterns, it's just not a typical thing. So, um, null binding, um, sorry if I pronounced that wrong, but, uh, null binding, null binding, um, stuff like that you'll see earlier. Um, but the idea of just sitting and like knitting yourself a sweater is not terribly common, like in, what we're used to, like sort of sense. It, there are areas that do it out of necessity and there are different variations on it, but just like the commonality of like knitting patterns, knitting patterns don't exist earlier than that because they're just, they, they don't fashionably do that. It is a practical thing. And in very cold places, having a knitted garment makes sense because it allows you to um, put a lot of air loft into your wool air, and like creates, um, you know, a very lofty, thick space. So it makes sense from the perspective of like air and cold and all that sort of that stuff. Um, but it's less, you know, common in say like even England um, or stuff like that. So at least for fashionable senses, no, you don't find a lot. You will not find knitting patterns earlier just because they didn't really pattern stuff. It was a career, it was a job, it was a trained thing and they didn't put them out for hobbies. So I guess that that's the better way to put it. There weren't hobbies of that sort of thing. <laughs> poofy 1890s sleeves. Oh man, it just depends on how poofy and the material you're using. Most of the time they just relied on the fabric in 1890s sleeves um, to do the job for it. But sometimes they put little ruffles or extra work in there too. Most of the ones I've seen just rely on the actual fabric. TV edit. Wow, they cut out the whole ghost. Christmas. There's because there's the whole section. Um, there's the whole love scene in there that got cut out, which is so good. The song is so good, um, and they're gradually adding that back in. I think next year's anniversary, so um, they will have. They'll definitely be releasing like the full version of Muppets Christmas Carol. I have made a fair number of gloves um, before. They're not difficult, they're just a little awkward. Oh, neat. They can't unravel that sort of thing? Oh, cool. Okay. Um, I don't think it's necessarily that people weren't interested in knitting and crochet as much as it was the fact that um, people didn't have free time to just have a hobby. <laughs> Like, that, that's not, the idea of you need to constantly be productive all hours of your life um, is a very 19th century, 20th century thing. Um, so you go back to like the 18th century, you, you know, once you did your work, it makes more sense for you to go have fun than for you to go and like try to knit clothing for children or something. Like, no, go, go party, <laughs> go have fun. So, like, it made people that knit were doing it to get paid. Mm. So, yeah. That's the sort of stuff that... <laughs> yeah, commercial patterns in general, very much. Um, a late 19th, early 20th century thing because of the, I said, the time that people had, like, having leisure time and filling it was a sign of being middle class. Um, 
more more and more things to give that sort of time but that's the thing like think about it the stuff that we're used to seeing like you know the the housewife sewing and knitting and making clothing for her family and like tea cozies and whatever it is comes about as she has more and more machinery to do her job for her like you know a dishwasher clothing washer things that did automated process for her well she shouldn't have downtime she shouldn't have free time you know she can get into trouble with that so now she needs to fill it with productive things <laughs> <laughs> not just sitting and talking with friends what no like do more it's yeah like i'm very susceptible to the oh no i need to keep constantly working but i understand that it is historically like oh so in terms of fun stories of not realizing the ending of things because of a, a cutoff so when i was a kid um back when we used uh, cassette tapes for all of our audio purposes that gives you some dating right there um i had some family friends that gave me two cassette tapes of christmas stories and i would listen to those every christmas and one of the stories was a little match girl uh which is one of the most like 19th century type depressing stories and they have a bunch of those but that's one of the ones that stuck around for some reason um and they had recorded it on the very end of the first cassette and it cut off at what to me as a child not knowing the story was a logical place to kind of stop the story um or at least pretty close to it and i just kind of like filled in the rest of the story for myself uh, and i didn't realize until i was like an adult and looking into fairy tale stories and like college because i was taking a class on them that i realized that she dies that was a really horrific, like, childhood killing moment right there. Because <laughs> I never knew. There's so many stories like that. That's the worst part. Like, they really loved those sorts of stories. But yeah, that was my horrific moment as a child. Well, not a child anymore, but it was like, oh no. Oh, that takes on a whole different meaning. Because I just figured they took her inside, you know. You see this poor child sitting outside your door. It's it's a Christmas story. Like, of course you would. Just... Yeah, at least they were happy before they did. Yeah, so once you start looking into morality stories of the 19th century and fairy tale morality stuff, it just... Yeah. It, it goes downhill really fast. Yeah, hobbies were for rich people for a long time. I keep moving myself further up. There we go. Oh. Oof, animation. Yeah, I do not need to see that. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of other stories like that that just never um, got as popular. Um, the Water Babies one was one that I came across a lot in my thesis research. Because it... <laughs> a like morality story on cleanliness <sighs> yeah <laughs> it's it's a lot yeah morality today means a dramatically different thing than it used to for them um you do a video on that at some point just because we tend to think of today we tend to think of morality as being like a like i know we get like the religious morality stuff but when people tend to be like oh you know back in the day they were more moral they tend to be talking about the way people dress or something like that so but they meant a lot more than that very complex Yep, you'd rather have the, the poor person die and realize, like, yeah, have, suffer and die. That's one of the reasons why uh, it was so romanticized to have tuberculosis. Because you suffered and died a very angelic and romantic death. I just... Yeah, I mean, hobbies are for rich people still fairly true today, let's be honest. Um, because otherwise we're told you should uh, monetize your hobby.
yeah looking into the history of knitting stuff is also really cool i learned a little bit of that like knitting history and um some of my like history of textiles and that sort of stuff classes in grad school but you know limited amount of time to cover it all then favorite collar styles oh man i just i love collars i'm a sucker for collars in general i'm not sure i have a favorite one just because i love i love a uh, just really yeah particularly pointy fun just dramatic collars oh my goodness bailey i think we got a package dropped off <laughs> Yeah, you could make money doing this and then lose all of your happiness. Fortunately for me, I, I have not gotten into that state of things. I've done this as my job and my hobby for so long that I've found like a nice happy balance of what I like to do and how to market it appropriately. Um, it definitely helps when I'm sewing stuff for myself and not making a business of sewing stuff for other people. That is where the happiness goes to die, I found. And some people love doing that. I do not. It just, it stressed me out too much um, when it, they weren't decisions like I would make. Um, and, you know, and situations where, like, you really, you can see how it would be such a perfect garment, but, you know, just that isn't what they want or they can't, like, that's just too outside their budget or whatever it is. So, um, like, that's definitely... I've never gotten to meet Gonzo. I did get to meet Kermit a few years back. <laughs> I also met Big Bert. No, it was Cookie Monster as a child, and that terrified me. I'm pretty sure that was like a life scarring moment right there. <laughs> one of those, uh, whatever they call them, where it's like key moments in your life that you remember. I was like, I was like no more than four. I was three or four, and I distinctly remember everything about that. On historic gift wrapping, oh, that'd be interesting. <laughs> that is that is a weird one. Like I've seen ab stuff about it from like early twentieth century when it was more like, you know, craft paper sort of thing, like brown paper. Before we started getting super fancy with it, in, like probably like the fifties, but. Almost done with this one. Ah, so yeah, making uh, making calls in the afternoon, social calls, um, tea dresses, afternoon dresses. They were a specific thing in the in the nineteenth century. They didn't necessarily have terminology for them in the eighteenth century like that, um, but. They definitely have, it's sort of an in-between level. You know, you're not talking evening formality, but definitely showing off fashionability. Um, the Kermit story. The Kermit story is just that I was on a Disney cruise. Um, that was one of the um, Disney vacation, I think it was a Disney vacation club one or something. And they had um, special guests show stuff. And one of which was Kermit, you're coming and hanging out for a while. So sat on a log and sang um, the rainbow song, <laughs> Rainbow Connection, <laughs> and chatted with people. It was really awesome. Okay, we're coming to the end of this. I can move on to the next part. Because this has been not that exciting of a thing to stitch. <laughs> I'm sure, I, I know people find it therapeutic and like calming to just watch people sew, so that's not a problem. But now we have the nitpicky part done. We have that. So it's silk taffeta on one side, wool on the other. I've come and done one corner. Um, like I said, the top corner will be taken up into the seam. So. Oh, 
stretch. <sighs> I remember. I remember. I want to say when we got our first computer, because um, we were early adopters of everything, but pretty much somewhere around there. I think I need the other one for this. I think, yeah. Alright. This is the one that has to go that direction. So I need the other. Oh, my Donald. <laughs> I feel like anyone who was a child of like the 80s or 90s is traumatized by a lot of things from Ronald McDonald with that whole um, series of characters they came up with and oh man that's a that is a whole big thing okay so I'm looking from the inside right now and there's this split that I've put so this is the front the center front of the garment and this is the skirt um, so this will actually get inserted. I'll flip it so it's right side out. So center front over here, and this gets inserted and seamed in here. So we'll have this nice sort of welting that will be the, the pocket entrance right there. So I need to stitch this to this opening, um, as it were, so. <laughs> One of my favorite um, gendered clothing things to talk about actually is the fact that like the, the typical, what we think of as like the masculine figure now with like broad shoulder pads and all of that um, was originally done for women in the 1930s. Like it started there. It didn't start with men, it started with women. It was quite a hilarious um, thing. Um, yeah, stitchers, well, most of the time you weren't working at night, like, that was one thing that they heavily discouraged, um, but finding what height and how to sit appropriately is definitely, um, a bit of an adventure. I, it was one of the reasons why I'm doing this on this sofa today, because it sits me super low, um, so it's actually at, like, a comfortable level once I put this on my lap. It sits very comfortably, um, and so I'm just kind of leaning over slightly. Uh, but if I am on a different type of sofa, I'll actually like make sure my legs are crossed up and all that. So all that. Uh, yeah, it would be it would be fun to wear for something Disney, though. It, most of my Disney things tend to be Disney World or whatever, so maybe not ever there. I think I die of heat, no matter what time of year. Um, maybe Disneyland might work cold enough in the winter. How do I start with YouTube? Um, I blame Abby. <laughs> no, um, I had wanted to do YouTube for a long time. It had been on my list um, for years, but it just wasn't a viable option um, for a long list of reasons until pretty recently. Let me flip this over and do it the other way. Aruba! Right. I'm trying to remember if I've been to Aruba. <laughs> I've been to a lot of places in the Caribbean. I feel like I made it there at some point. Just thinking about this, I'm like, I need to like go back and make sure I know all the places I've been. Problem is when you do cruises, like, you just, especially I did a, a couple as a kid, and I don't remember what I did when I was on those, so you lose track. Okay, I'm going to squeeze that in there, because I have this nice little line that I know to stitch on. I should have marked things with thread, but I am doing this the fast way. Oh, I need to watch the documentary, Sesame Street documentary. Um... Now this is just like a little wooden thing that I use. Uh, it's meant to be an artboard. I need to buy another one because I've pretty well wrecked this one, but I've had it since college. So <laughs> I feel like... Um, yeah, Abby and I have been friends since... 2014? We've known each other for a lot longer than that. Um, 2012? Maybe? Whenever she moved to Williamsburg, somewhere around there. And we currently, yes, are 
next door neighbors um, for a short while. Short while longer. <laughs> I feel like that's what you just put on like, maybe, maybe do like a velvet pair of trousers or something. Like a simulation of fur without actually fur. This is just pinned on. Obviously, I'm not being super detailed about everything today and like basting or whatever, but so I can go ahead and stitch these two together from the, from the looks of, yeah, that'll be good. And then I can do, ooh, before I do that, now I have to stop and think about that. Um, trying to decide whether I need separate out layers or not with that <laughs> Bailey goodness <laughs> ma'am hey um because obviously if I do it say that way and we fold like that then the pocketing can do that but then we've got all of our mass one direction and looking at the original, it does not appear like they do that. It looks like they have a much more even distribution. So it looks like they are able to sort of like um, split like that, like it's more like that sort of thing rather than going one side or the other. It looks more like they've done that, which means that in order to do that, not have raw edges, I need to have the silk that I put and the wool um, as separate. So, yeah. Yeah, and I, I'd wanted to do YouTube for a long time just because um, I used to do a lot of blogging, but that stopped really being, it was never the most effective way to share this stuff. Um, and I always kind of wanted to be able to do more. So this is, this is, Oh yeah, I mean, you can always put the collar on as a separate piece. That's really common. So, <laughs> where's the barking dog? <laughs> yeah, colorful language. Um, I mean, you edit that out if you need to, or you, you put stuff over it, you get creative. It can be fun. Um, okay, so I think the way that I have to stitch this, this little pocket welting strip on. So there's multiple ways that you can put pocket welting on. Um, I went ahead and did all of my finishing, which doesn't have to be the first step. Usually my first step is to stitch the welt <laughs> to the opening. Um, so I'm going to go back and do that now, because if I stitch the whole thing together, then it's all got to go to one side and I want it to go to two sides. So I need to be able to like have it open up. So I need to just stitch wood, wool to wool. Um, and then the silk and the pocketing will fold down over it. Um, and allow me to like, you know, do that with it rather than having to put all the bulk, which gets really bulky. If you put all of it to one side, it gets really bulky versus that, which is much flatter. So that's what I, that's what I'm like pondering through. I'm like, okay, if I do that and that and that and that, then I should be good. So. <laughs> On my old blog. Yeah, it's still around. I haven't gotten rid of it yet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I wish I'd started a channel. I started grad school instead of starting a channel. Um, it was something that I heavily considered right about the point that I started grad school. So it was just getting up, but I had no idea what I was doing. And it seemed so daunting to try and do video editing. So that was, I, I mean, I should have, I'm not saying I shouldn't have done grad school. Grad school was great in many ways, but also <laughs> if I had started it then. <laughs> Yeah, 
I mean, I generally have a bit of an outline for my videos, but it's not formalized. I tend to talk through them and then I'm just go from there. Okay. So you gotta start down here. And yeah, editing is the hard part. Doing the stuff, yeah, I've done it for years. Filming it, uh, a little difficult, making sure that you get the right angles and the right numbers and all that. Like that's been the hardest part for me is figuring out, um, making sure that what I do film is usable quality. Uh, which is one of the reasons why I'm super excited that I just got a notification that my new camera shipped. <laughs> like this, this baby has been really useful. Um, this is just the, the ZV-E10. Um, and it allows me to do streaming really easily because I can just plug it directly into my laptop. So highly recommend that um, for a lot of things. And it's my backup camera for different angles and things. Uh, I use it interchangeably uh, with my nicer camera in my videos and I don't think anybody's ever noticed. So do recommend uh, those, but it, yeah, the, the editing is the scary part. Um, I, it depends on the type of video as to how long editing takes me. Um, because it, if it's a sewing video, I can actually edit that pretty fast. I am a good idea of like clipping down, good at pretty, pretty good at clipping things down to be the right length pretty fast um but when it comes to the more research ones those take forever to edit because i have to put in all of those research images and the citations and other reference material for it that's where the time goes so um the new one coming is the uh new sony the a7 IV. oh i'm so excited about it because it will allow me to do better jobs of this sort of thing with focus um, work so that that's been my big problem. I've got a Canon currently and it is really Not the best for focus work. Um, so I've struggled with a lot of footage being out of focus um, I will be right back. My dog is hitting the needs to go out button <laughs> repeatedly Just whacking me all of the but she has one of those button pads like famous dogs on TikTok, and she's just she's going nuts for it She's like no, I need to so I'll be right back <laughs> Take a moment. Look at this. I'm taking a quick break. Ah, where'd my two mini screens at once? Grad school planning. Oh man. <laughs> oh, that is. I don't know. I, the grad school I chose was a proximity thing as much as anything else. It was just the fact that I happened to live, um, to move to an area where there was. Just did this briefly. Um, moved to an area where there is a grad school, or was at that time, a grad school. Um, I mean, it's still there, I'm not there. So that was my luck, but there's, grad school is hard. Um, so I need to, I've done a lot of research on stockings, I just haven't really, um, I did a Patreon live on stockings recently for like modern repro ones and other options. Oh, yeah, Abby's uh, hose video was me coming in to help because she ended up with a weird pattern. I was like, I don't know how to make this work. I could own any historical building. I don't, I don't know. I just, I just want like a, I don't know that I found one that's like my dream building. I just really love Art Nouveau. Um, what do I edit in? I edit in DaVinci. Um, because it doesn't crash as much as Adobe. <laughs> and other things like that. I'm going to go let the dog in. I'll be right back. But yeah, I tend to edit, uh, I, t I do all of my editing in DaVinci, um, which is free in its, like, basic state, uh, which covers most of the stuff you need. So...
and dodge my way back into my spot. There's a whole bunch of stuff over here, like lights and cameras and everything. So I'm like dodging my way back in. Um, I do not have a P.O. box currently. I was using Abby sometimes, but uh, yeah. Um, what do I use to stream? And I'm just an OBX right now. Uh, that was just where I started. Uh, maybe it was our friend Chrissy. I don't know. Do, 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 do. Yeah, I do not recommend editing on your phone. That just sounds stressful, man. <laughs> Favorite dinosaur? Um, I am partial to raptors, which is just from the fact that, like, I was just the right age when, <laughs> um, when Jurassic Park came out and I begged and pleaded my parents to let me go see it. My dad did not want me to go see it. He was like, you're going to have nightmares. Um, but he acquiesced and I got to go see it and I did not have nightmares. Um, but I did spend like a solid week running around the house pretending to be a raptor. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, my master's is in this basically. Um, it's, I'm trying to remember what the exact terminology was. It changed over to being called a material culture program. Um, while I was there, but technically I didn't graduate with that because it was after I already started, but like textile and fashion history, essentially. I want to get into historical costuming. Um, depends on the... The dog's sitting on everything. Depends on the era. Um, oh yeah, I can move back to this. Ah, back to this. Back to sewing that you are interested in because there's certain areas that are easier than others. Um, and sometimes it's just starting with undergarments and basic things. Um, so depending on the era, um, but starting with casual stuff or undergarments can be really helpful. Build your stuff up. Stream labs. Yeah, OBS does fine. Um, I need to try more streaming options. I'm gonna get like a streaming board and all that stuff. My, my laptop manages it all fine, so. And now I have not been to the casinos in historical wear. There's not really anything to do that would be like visually interesting or anything like that. Like I, I just avoid the casino area. Every once in a while I have to drive through there, but there's some good restaurants nearby, but no. Oh. <sighs> my Fun fact, um, one of the things I need to make more of for my bathroom that I made years and years ago are um, like cut silhouette work, uh, but I did it of dinosaurs rather than like traditional things you make silhouettes of, um, and they're all dinosaur puns, like T-Rex, eh, like so it's a T-Rex holding a cup of tea, um, you know, with a top hat on, or a, a velociraptor velocipede sort of thing, <laughs> so it's all... It's all really, really tongue in cheek. It's really fun because you go in there and it looks like, oh yeah, beautiful silhouettes. And then you actually like look at them. It's like, that's not what, <laughs> wait. Okay. Dinotopia miniseries. I don't think so. hanging thing um this thing I, it's modern it's not historic I don't think I don't think it's actually an antique um but I think it might have come from one of those like antique mall type places so I don't know <laughs> I have so much stuff and a lot of things I did not buy people have bought for me so I honestly don't know that may have been something my mother just saw somewhere The red wool is from Burnley and Trowbridge. Um, I bought it a while back, so I don't think they ha they don't have this one currently. They might have something similar, um, but this one is a very very good quality red wool cloth from Burnley and Trowbridge that I happened to buy a while back, thankfully. So I have definitely had a lot of fun with textiles for this. Unfortunately, this is just thick enough. I can't easily just like do single stitch back stitch. I kind of have to stab back and forth, which is taking more time. Ooh. 
I am going to do some machine stitching on this. Uh, I do admit that because machine stitching is useful as far as it is faster. And I fully admit that that will definitely happen. Because there's no reason for me to do long internal seams um, by hand when I'm not filming the whole process and showing people and no one's going to see it once it's closed up. Um, I don't have a streaming schedule currently, but I would like to do more. That's one of my my goals for next year. Um, this camera was one of the first things I had to do, and that was back in like August, September when I got this one. Um, and so that allowed me to start doing this like sort of thing a little bit more. Um, and once I get the other new camera, that will allow me to have two really good ones, and then I feel like, I, and then I get like a stream board and all that. So, um, but my current main camera that I use is a Canon, and Canon is not streaming friendly. So that, I've done a couple lives with it, and I hated it. Like it's just, nope. So I do have I do have a thimble, and I sometimes use it when I do leather work, and that's about it. I haven't been to Junkies. I drive by them a lot because where I get my haircut is down by that area. But um, I, yeah, they they have a lot more like early, like 20th century vintage -y sort of stuff. Um, I tend to go with all really early things. Oh, neat. Coats. I don't know of any options for vegan souls. Um, aside from rubber, and that's not better. <laughs> so that's one of the reasons why I haven't made vegan shoes of any type. You can find some leather options that might work for uppers, um, but there's just, there, from a um, standpoint of better for the environment, vegan leather is almost never better for the environment. So uh, there are some possible exceptions, but usually they're very expensive, very limited, and very hard to get a hold of anything. How do I decide what goes into a video and what gets cut? Um, I film everything and then it gets cut down to very short blips. <laughs> so almost everything in a format goes into it. I want to start doing slightly more artistic filming of different ways. I'm hoping to get a little bit more with um, the shoe video for next week. I have the basic filming done of one shoe but I would like to do a little more artsy stuff for the second shoe um, to try some things. So that's on my list of, of things to try out and then start to come up. I'm good at visualizing stuff, so I haven't had as much of an issue with that. Oh, tiny little back stitches. I don't know why I'm doing such tiny little back stitches when you're never going to see this. But I suppose it needs to be a good functional. Yeah, I can. My Canon I bought a while back, and it was a very good choice for what I needed it for at the time. And I wasn't doing as much filming at the time, I was doing mostly photography. And it did well enough for the filming that I needed it to do. But, but, and it was definitely better than Nikon <laughs> at the time. That was not the, the right option if you wanted to do any filming. Um, but now that Sony has, like, cornered the market on it, like movie film stuff just yep so yeah i am hoping to start streaming on twitch i think that'd be really fun to do this sort of thing on twitch um because there aren't a lot of people that do stuff like i do over there yet but i feel like there's a place for it I am not, I, don't worry about being too personal with me. I'm not easily offended or anything. Like, unless you start saying stuff that you know is bad. <laughs> but I'm not catching half of what's going through. I'm trying to look for question marks and, and things, trying to speed read. And I'm a fast reader, but there's still a lot because I'm trying to stitch at the same time. So sorry if I miss things from people, but... Um, a lot of my stuff is self-done. I need to set up for pictures more often. I just don't 
the issue is I just don't have a good space for that. Like I have the the backdrop that I use for everything, um, but putting a bunch of time into like editing that to be something more. Yeah, I love Swanson's. I haven't had a chance to buy anything from them, but I follow them on like all the social media. I love Swanson's fabrics. Um, Twitch is not just for gaming, it's just for streaming. It, it is definitely heavy on gaming, um, but I've been watching people build like wood structures and, and like do, you know, leather work and stuff like that on there too. So there is gaming, but there is other stuff too. Um, so I think it would be interesting to see like what I could do over there. Um, so. Ideally I managed to find a way that I could like dual stream but that's just way beyond me managing. Like that's when you definitely need um, somebody mod and all that stuff so. How did I develop the patience and skill to do this? <laughs> um, I've been making stuff since I was a very small child. So this has just always been part of what I naturally did. Um, I don't think it was ever forced upon me in any way. It wasn't like my parents trained me for that. Like patience was definitely something that was highly valued in the house growing up. I remember that, but just making things and taking your time with it. Yeah, this is my full-time job at this point. Um, don't think I would manage to have time. Like I've taken some weeks off here and there. I'm hoping to start doing it more regularly, but this month kind of, I, I started in a regular schedule of like, oh, I'm gonna do three on, one off, and then the holiday season with like, getting offers for sponsorships and all that kind of threw that around, so. How do I clean my non-washable fabrics and clothes? Um, I tend to wear things underneath them so I don't have to. <laughs> I've definitely done some things pretty horribly, like wrecked them um, that I had to clean later, but those took very specific things based off of what the staining was or the fabric was. And I also have the assumption that my clothing is going to get worn and lived in. So some wear and tear is fine. Most of the stuff you just air it out and it's okay. Oh, cool, they reintroduced the category. That'll be good. I have a tailor's ham there. It tends to be when it comes down to suddenly needing tools um, for me, it tends to be a shoemaking. I have started a habit of buying a new tool for every pair of shoes that I make. Something that I wish I had had the previous time or, you know, I'm doing research on a new technique or style or something, I noticed that that would be really useful. Um, so I definitely end up with uh, new tools for shoemaking all the time and there are so many that I wish I had but I can't make any of those I just have to buy them. <laughs> emergency ham yeah those <laughs> I do want to get some of the fancier tailoring hams at some point that I think would be really helpful I just have a really basic one so
in there. Uh, there are definitely reasons to wash your fabric a fair number of times. I've never heard four or five, but it probably depends on the fabric and what you're doing with it. If you are, say, doing like children's clothing, um, then that would make sense. But most of the time, once will do ya. Unless you're trying to get rid of some finishes or smells or whatever. If it's vintage stuff, then yeah, multiple times is good. Dude, I'm not feeling motivated. It helps for me to have, like, I have to have it done by. Um, the, the filming schedule doesn't allow me to not be motivated. Um, sometimes that's when I do the, the research portion, like that. There are some projects that I just launch right into and go for it, and there are others where I will spend a lot of time doing research ahead of time and looking for the right um, goods and, you know, just stuff to make it out of. And so that can really help um, in terms of incentivizing me to do stuff while also making it so I can spend a day on the sofa doing research. I talk with Bernadette and Morgan all the time. Obviously I see Abby all the time, but that's just what really like. <laughs> um, have I ever found a historic garment where they just kind of, not usually midway through a seam, but definitely like, garments will have multiple hands that worked on them or alterations that were done completely differently things where yeah at some point they're like clearly they were doing a really exquisite job on this and taking their time and then reached a point where it's like oh no we need this tonight and like the last bit of like that one type of trim is just the worst tacking of whatever so Do you have to use a last? Um, uh, yeah, depending on the type of shoe you're making, pretty much. Um, they, you can do soft shoes without it, but, and early styles, but they're not shaped. Um, the lasting process actually puts shape into your upper. It's not just like a pattern that's flat. You will actually end up with curves and stretching because of it, so. Um, you can't like pattern a shoe. Where did I learn to make shoes and last? I, I took a workshop on how to make 18th century women's shoes um, from a friend and the last portion he taught me some last making and I just kind of went from there. Um, I liked doing carving and sculpting and stuff like that um, when I was younger so it's just an extension of that. How do I remember what fabrics and notions? <laughs> um, this is a person with way too much black silk thread right now. <laughs> yeah. um, I have a pretty good organizational system going, but yeah, sometimes I will end up with extras. But it tends to be thread uh, more so than anything else, but I have everything really well organized in terms of, of that. Um, beetled linen, you can get it from Burnley and Turbridge in the US or McCulloch and Wallace um, in the UK are the two sellers that I tend to buy from. So. <laughs> Period of history I find the silliest, man. Like, 1830s and 40s just gets weird. There are definitely some, like, some 16th, 17th century era stuff in there. Like, I don't, there are some specific things with that, which I, I just do not understand the puffy pants. No matter what I try to do, I can't visualize, like, that ever looking good. So, I mean, I've seen those those types of, like, puffy trunk hose sort of things looking good on men who are particularly shapely in the calf and very tall. Um, but that's been about it. And I just, like, I love that era in terms of upper body. I cannot, I just, I don't understand it. Oh, I've been, I've got water behind me. I've been, I've been sipping here and there. 
Yeah, I remember I'm used to filming for like 45 minutes straight without stopping and cutting it down to 30. <laughs> this is no different. The thing that I found with dry cleaning when it comes to like um, stuff is that they only clean the outside of your garment, they won't clean the inside. Um, so if you're dry cleaning something to get rid of like body odor, it won't do anything. They won't turn it right side out, like wrong side out and deal with it. So it's very surface. It's good for stains and exterior stuff. It doesn't help with interior. Uh, better off wearing layers and all of that. Um, and yeah, brushing things down and all of that. Um, I might do a sewing room tour at some point. I've done a little bit on like Patreon stuff, but it's it, it's not a terribly exciting room. I move it around a lot, so it constantly changes. <laughs> but maybe if I do something more organizational in the future. Oh. I think it's more snacks. I wish you could hide way more than snacks in there. <laughs> The first thing I ever sewed, I don't remember that far back. <laughs> I have no memory um, from when I was like two. <laughs> I know I was sewing on the regular by the time I was like three or four, so. I remember, I think I got my own sewing machine at age five or six. <laughs> so I honestly couldn't tell you what the first thing was. It's just a normal part of life. Oh yeah, Angela's pumpkin pants that Morgan stole <laughs> when we were in New York. Like she pulled them off, I was impressed, but I, I cannot in the same way. Um, this coat won't end up being a video just because though there are major differences between it and the brown coat that I made, um, it's just not different enough to warrant its own thing. Like the big differences are at the pockets, which is kind of what I'm working on now. Um, and a little bit in some other construction. So I might, I'll probably film little bits of it and in the final reveal video there will be a little bit of a discussion about it as well as some of the other pieces that won't get their entire own videos. Um, the shoes and the hat will have their own videos and everything else will just be little snippets in the final version and I'll probably put up a full version of some of the other parts on Patreon but this won't be full length. So. Sewing. I sometimes I have on sometimes I have shows while I'm sewing, um, but I can do it in complete silence for like the entirety of the day, and that's fine. <laughs> My brain's just working like five steps ahead usually, so okay, we're almost done back stitching this. I feel like this stuff has just taken so long to get to. I might be back in the night. I don't know if I'll manage a live tomorrow. I might. I might do this again tomorrow, but it might be at a different time. We'll see. Um, how do we come to know each other? Um, just talking online. Um, sharing. Don't want to knock over my tea. I forgot I need that. Um, just eventually created a chat group to just share stuff. Um, so that's how I met, initially met most of them. Um, I've spent a fair amount of time hanging out with some people now. <laughs> yeah, I definitely was a Girl Scout when I was younger. Lots of, lots of things. Yeah, Abby and I go way back and she's part of the reason I kind of was introduced to a bunch of other people. She's been doing video work for a lot longer than I have. I 
kind of gave me the confidence to be able to do it myself. I was like, okay, well, I can always just ask her if I have editing questions. I, I can manage this. And then I was like, oh, well, this is actually not that bad. So. Yeah, thread knots. Oof. I was a Girl Scout for a long time until I moved middle school. Okay. I want to make sure that I do this pocket up right because it's going to get a lot of wear and tear and I want to make sure it's not coming apart. The original has a lot of repair work around it because clearly it wasn't stitched as well. An aspect of modern dress that I wish was more common in modern times. Um, I do wish we still stuck with shirts and shifts and layering like that because it's just so much easier than I mean actually like have washable clothing. <laughs> I do. I wish that was more like typical. Back to the Future 3. I haven't, I haven't seen it. I didn't even know there was a Back to the Future. <laughs> I am out of the loop. YouTube has failed me in terms of giving me uh, trailers and stuff on that one. I don't know, I, I never really watched much Back to the Future, so I don't, I have not seen the third one. I went to see Donny Osmond so many, many years ago. <laughs> Back when the original Joseph was running everywhere. I saw that so many times, not intentionally. My favorite project of the year. I don't know. I've been thinking, I need to go through and actually figure out what I did this year at this point. I'm like, I'm not sure I remember. Worst movie with a good historical wardrobe. I don't know. watch more movies. <laughs> I have short patience when it comes to terrible movies. Um, I'm just working on sort of pushing this out. I'll have to iron it in order to get it really good, but I look good enough for right now. So the reason why I did that is because then on the outside you have a nice flat looking seam there rather than it being bulk on one side or the other. Um, so I've done that. What I can do now, I could technically backstitch the pocketing to the silk and da, 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 but that takes a lot of time and is not actually the more effective way of doing it because the silk is so thin. So having it go um, towards that direction is not a big deal. Um, like it's not gonna build up bulk. So I can sort of flatten that seam out, make sure it stays down as it's supposed to. I need to clip that corner maybe. No, I'm good. Okay, so let's flatten that out with some pins. I don't remember much. I mean, I did a lot of Girl Scout stuff, but I don't remember anything in particular. Oh, Back to the Future was 30 Then I definitely, I, <laughs> I didn't watch a lot of movies. <laughs> I, I feel like I missed out on a lot of stuff from like the 80s and 90s um, just because my my family was not terribly up on um, how to put this modern culture. <laughs> like I was very unaware of modern culture and a lot of movies and things like that. So I am not. So I'm like, I, I don't know. 
I don't know about most things. Okay. Put another stitch off there. Um, yeah, I've had to, I actually really want to do a video about, um, scrapping projects or starting over projects or, like, the issues with dream projects and all that stuff. I really want to do, like, a proper video on that. Um, I have a great example that I, <laughs> that I can share of, um, a pair of shoes that that happened to me with. Someday I'll make them properly. I don't know. Um, but I learned a lot, which was the valuable part, so... Oh yeah, I still watch a lot of YouTube. I spend a lot of time on there. Um, I don't watch a lot of costume content just because, like, I need a break. <laughs> uh, it's not that I necessarily need, like, another hobby. I just need a break from that sort of stuff. Um, and if I'm watching that, that, I'm always, like, constantly analyzing things. Um, but I watch a lot of other people on YouTube. Um, a lot of other makers, repairers, like, that sort of stuff. I like watching stuff getting fixed up. Okay, so that gets us our welt in place, as it were. Um, what I need to do next is get the pocketing in to place, and then I can stitch that down. It also looks like on the original they top stitched right here. What looks like an infinitely tiny, tiny stitch is barely visible. Um, but yeah, they top stitch right here, and I'm wondering if that might be good to do now, rather than... Yeah, Baumgartner. <laughs> yeah, I watch that all the time. Um, rather than through that and dealing with the pocketing. Because it's going to be kind of bulky, so I'm going to do that now. I'm going to go ahead and do that little back stitch just beyond the seam allowance there, which, I think I just bonked my camera, um, will hold down the silk and will keep everything really nice and flat and will help flatten out the seam. That makes sense. Because there's always the question, like, I can see on the original, like, what, what's going on, but you got to figure out what steps go when. So I think doing that before I get the pocketing in, because I don't think it's done with the pocketing at the same time. That's just too much bulk, too much going on. Um, but it definitely would be good to do as a way to hold that down. So switch back to this thread, the thin stuff, because it definitely looks very, very thin on the original. Hmm. Hmm. I'm not familiar with the highway man. That sounds interesting. No, I quit American Duchess about a year ago. I mean, the designs that are there are still things that I've worked on because the process is slow. But <laughs> I haven't had my hands in anything for a while. Howard, you just couldn't bring yourself to cut. Yeah, I have a lot of really nice or sometimes even antique textiles that I don't know if they'll ever get that some of them were purchased with the intention of making something out of them. Uh, then they came in and were a lot nicer than I expected, so... Um, they just might get framed at some point. I just need more wall space. <laughs> Problem with the house with a lot of windows is you don't have a lot of walls. I don't have any room to put anything. decide whether I'm going to be doing this as a backstitch or as a spaced backstitch. There's looks like the world's tiniest backstitch, but it's hard to see. I've got it pulled up on a big screen there. I think I'm going to do a spaced backstitch for this though, because I don't need to do, I don't want it to be too visible. My largest collection of textiles is, uh, or one particular type of textiles from my grandmother. I have so much yardage of um, 
Ultra Suede that I will never be able to use in a lifetime. <laughs> oh, book binding videos. Oh, I should look into that. That's cool. I recently discovered the people that do like the super realistic tiny models. <laughs> like, oh no. <laughs> do not need. It's like, okay, well, if I watch it, it'll satisfy my need to do this because I do not need to start doing that. Have I been asked to make stuffed animals? Um, no, I used to make them when I was really little. Like that was typical, but I don't think I've done it um, as an adult. How do I connect people without discussing anything controversial? I don't know, I don't, I mean, I'm sure it comes up occasionally and I've definitely um, had my fair share of people who think some of the stuff I discuss is controversial. Um, had some very angry messages over the years, but. <sighs> I don't know, I think most people come to this type of stuff in a very positive way, so. Oh, I love Fluvog. I got to go into one of their stores recently. I was very tempted. Like, nope, nope, nope. I make my own shoes. I don't need to, I don't need to buy them any. Um, three, four miles on cement. I recently got a pair from Joe Bear and oh, I love those. One of the most comfortable things I've ever bought. So I highly recommend their stuff as a like very functional, you're starting to come undone. Um, very, very functional hard wearing type of shoe. Um, so that's one of my recommendations. We're gonna pin you back there so that way I'm not like this is not a finish point that's just me trying to trap down that end of this is starting to undo really fast I thought I left enough on them but clearly not so tamales wait working without waistcoats. Um, part of the change in working clothing comes with the change in what work is. Um, so factory life clothing versus trade work, um, farm labor, that sort of thing. Like it's just more and more machines to do the work means that um, different clothing is able to be worn or more clothing is able to be worn, so. I'm sure that a lot of those factories and things like that also had um, dress codes. Hi, what's up? <laughs> okay, hi, what are we doing? Where are you going? Do you want behind me? Is that what you want? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, Joe Bear, it's uh, J-O, bear uh, i think it's just one word they sell on etsy um currently they might have pre-order stuff going um or they might have some that are available but i really 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 love their their boots um i got a pair at the same time that bernadette did and we had the same exact shoes they're so bad yeah they did old stuff with nevers yeah they've done other um things too figure out machine I don't I don't know I've not gone through a lot of machines in my life I'm not very like as much as I know about sewing machines like in terms of sewing the actual machinery blah. yeah no Luke Tone is one of the ones that I've come across I <laughs> think YouTube was like I think you'll like this I was like oh no um, a place that sells good silk brocade um, Renaissance silks Renaissance Fabrics, Renaissance Silks. Renaissance Fabrics has a good variety, um, depending on how much money you're willing to put into this. Um, NY, I think it's New York Designer Fabrics is another one. Um, but I spent a lot of time on Etsy. But those Renaissance and um, 
NY Designer, New York Designer, the two that I get a lot of my fancier things from. I highly recommend if you need like button boots or fancy stuff like that, you don't want to invest or you can't invest in super expensive stuff, do spats. And like they were way more common um, historically than I think we give them credit for. Um, so like I need to do, I need to make some and do a video on that in the near future. It's on my list. Um, but I highly recommend that because then it's more important to find a shoe that's comfortable and maybe has the right toe shape. And then you can do all sorts of really amazing stuff, but without having to actually do shoe making. So, all right, so got this nice little spaced back stitch, little prick stitch. All right. I'm opposite from what I'm looking at. Ah, um, little spaced prick stitch there. So that's coming out well, which just holds down the silk in the back. It holds open the seam allowance and should finish things off really nicely. I don't think it's the exact same stitch that the original used, but I really don't care. So. Yeah, I keep coming across more and more um, drafting manual stuff for spats. There's uh, some in the 1840s manual that I've been referencing lately, which is cool. Victorian to 30s. Um, I don't know a particularly great... <sighs> like, the, the Victorian tailor is pretty good, but it's definitely, like... Like, there's only so much you can fit into something. Um, there are some vintage coacher stuff things out there, but like the once you hit the late nineteenth century, tailoring doesn't change dramatically. Um, like fine tailoring doesn't change dramatically. So even the modern books, um, like the you know David Coffin and other stuff like that. I'm trying to. It's behind a thing right now, so I can't see over on my bookshelf. Um, but even modern tailoring books, like, because those can get much more in-depth. How do I budget for projects? Um, I'm not good at that sort of thing. <laughs> I tend, it's one of the reasons why I've started, like, pushing things out into multiple videos. Um, not just to be able to do things correctly and all that, but also because then it spreads out the cost rather than cramming this into like three videos and the amount of money that I would have spent on this outfit for three videos would not have come back around. Um, but I put a lot of time into finding the right stuff um, and that includes finding stuff that I know is a good like cost for me. So it's just time. Cause there's so much that goes into all of these. Um, I don't have a breaking in period for any of the shoes that I've made. Ever. Even the thicker ones. I've never really had that. Um, but in terms of shortcuts for cutting costs, um, obviously linings. And uh, I mean, I definitely will do things like some synthetic blends. But. Am I going to fix the front of the gonzo trousers? No, they're fine. Um, <laughs> I found it amusing when I sat down, but it's not a big deal. All pants do that to some extent. And it looked way worse on camera than it did from my personal angle, like looking down. Uh, I am going to put better buttons on them. I did order antique buttons, so I'm going to replace those and put make a pair of, of braces and put those on. That's also on the list. But I can, if I can find time. Yeah, overshoes. Yeah, I have a couple vintage pairs. Yeah, my previous like cosplay things could be put down into three videos, but this one was just like, mm, nope. I was either gonna have to not do videos on a lot of parts, um, in which case I was like, all right, well. I basically have to have the whole thing done before I start it if I'm doing that. 
Um, cause if I did this in three videos, it'd be like, all right, I could do one on like the waistcoat and trousers together, one on the coat and then one on like accessories. And that'd be about all I could manage. So. Fabric websites to order from. Cost and selection, um, I always go to Etsy first if I need a major selection. I start with places that I know have good quality stuff um, to get a basis of whether those sorts of things are even available. But, so I go through like Berlin Trowbridge and Renaissance Fabrics and Mood. Um, Mood has a really good selection, but definitely try to get stuff with sale um, or coupon or whatever from them. And then, um, but yeah, I usually end up just wandering through Etsy for a obscene amount of hours. <laughs> a lot of Etsy. Still sore from... Still sure, really sore from my booster. So one thing I've noticed, my everything's just sore. Yeah, Joe Bear did pre-order back in like September, October. So the they're probably trying to fill all of those right now before the holidays and they'll probably come back around next early next year with available stuff. Yeah, I definitely want to get a pair of flu vogs. Um I as much as I like love their style, some of the heels are just a little outside of my like physical comfort range in terms of the weird shapes. I feel like they'd be uncomfortable. But so definitely want to at some point though. I can't manage this one with it. I'm so sad that like this is just thick enough I'm having to stab stitch everything. It's taking you so long. <gasps> and 1890s corset reconstruction. Uh linen tailor's tight for a waist state. Possibly. As long as you can find one wide enough. Um, a lot of the waist stays I've seen, you can see plain weaves, but you can also see like a weird um, sort of herringbone weave. I found some of those, um, they're actually satin on one side too, which has been interesting. Um, no, I'm actually, I'm technically grandfathered in as a member of foundations, but I don't actively participate just because I wrote for them way back. Yeah. Yeah, I... Got the booster on Monday, hoping that I'd feel better by today. I'm still pretty sore, which is mostly down to like uh, being able to actually sleep in position I want to, because I can't sleep on my left side because my uh, lymph node right here is really angry at me. <laughs> like, oh, that I'm okay, but I can't do that. And sleeping on my back hurts my back if I do that too much. I am too old for this. Ah. Yeah, I, I really like Fluvog stuff. It's just the weird heels that they've had lately that stick out so far and back. I'm like, eh, that's going to require a completely different walk and gait. And I'd rather just make... Challenging the corset myth. Um, the very first... Well, aside from the fact that like that was a myth that was around in the 19th century and they were challenging it in the 19th century, um, in the more modern sense, it really picks up in the 1990s. I've seen a few references in the 1970s that try to be like, eh, like, yeah. um, but it really picked up in the 90s because that's when fashion history as an actual historic field picked up. So that makes a big difference. Um, trying to legitimize the academic nature of that. Um, so fashion history be, is, is kind of when we really start busting myths in the 90s, 
when we start doing the research and when things like the internet become available. Um, we start putting useful stuff on the internet. We start being able to do research and have access to more things and can really get like all of the information gathered together and figure it out. But Bailey is doing wonders for my back right now. Oh. I've got like, it's like having a nice little heating pad back here. <laughs> yeah, the, I need to do a video. It's in my list for spring, probably maybe late, late winter, but sometime like probably February, March, maybe late February, early March, something like that for um video that I've been planning to do for a while and just haven't worked myself up to. Um, on where the corset myth origin came from and why it's perpetuated and why people can get very um, emotionally angry about it. Um, because understanding why people have an emotional reaction to a myth that does not affect them at all. It's a myth that doesn't matter. Like it won't change their, their actual life in any way. It doesn't change. It's not like, you know, proving like, oh, your religion or your, it, it doesn't, it doesn't actually change someone's life nowadays to believe one way or the other on the corset. Um, but people have strong emotional reactions to it. And so I really want to talk about that um, and why that's, <laughs> um, why that is the way it is right now. Um, and why some people are very frustrated by it. Um, like when you try and convince them otherwise. Yeah, we just made it to the point where we could go get boosters for anybody and everybody, um, which I am very thankful for because, I, I mean, I don't leave the house much for a long list of reasons, but my asthma is pretty high up there on the list of things that concern me. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the idea, of course, it's being bad as a feminist thing is um, it makes people feel better about themselves. Look at us, we've come so far. We no longer allow torture. We no longer allow ourselves to deal with that. Um, because if you understand that women weren't actually being forced into that stuff, um, you have to start giving them an autonomy and a power that we don't want to attribute to them. And it's just that, that, that old feminist stuff that is very, um, actually anti-feminine and pro-masculine like sort of stuff it, so it there, there's a lot to unpack there i am excited to eventually do a video on that but it's gonna i know perfectly well um i'm gonna get a lot of argument and hate on that <laughs> i already got enough with talking about small feet as it was um and any time we've done any like corset myth busting video on like abby's channel or anything like that there's always some crazy stuff that comes from that Oof. Got an email recently that was just like, okay. the live stream will go up on my channel afterwards so whoever can watch the whole thing not that i not that i think this is like that organized or terribly interesting but um <laughs> i know some people really enjoy hanging out and chatting and i'm trying to talk a little bit about what i'm sewing on it's just going kind of slow um i figured it was going to stitch up a little bit faster and that i'd at least get like one proper pocket done within like two hours but here we are at two and a half and nope that's not going to happen so um but I will definitely post progress stuff on this. And obviously it'll be part of the, the finished reveal of everything. Here's my stitch. But yeah, I've had a lot of people tell me that my videos are very useful in teaching or um, bringing up in classes and talking about different ways to do research and site sources and all of that. Dog snoring. And also twitching, I can feel her paws going. <sighs> yeah, honestly, tight pants does more 
of a is more of a problem, especially when they're like low fries. Oof. I've definitely been forcing myself to learn a lot about shoemaking lately, so that, that's that been a lot of fight just to learn other types of that, but I don't know that there's any, like there's a lot of sewing projects I would love to do that are daunting in terms of just the sheer number of hours that would go into them, but I've done this for so long I've stopped finding the actual construction part to be challenging. <laughs> Like, this has been a challenge because I don't know what I'm doing and I had to figure it out and that part has been very, very challenging. But, like, this coat will be way easier than the, the coat I just did. <laughs> oh. but, okay. Get to the end of this and then it'll be time to throw in the actual pocketing, at which point I will probably pin it in and then wrap up the stream because at some point... I need to take a break. Um, but I don't know. I don't know if I should... I don't know if I have time to fit one in tomorrow. I might be able to do a shorter one tomorrow, but I'm not sure I'll have much interesting comparison to what I've already been doing. But maybe... I'm going to try to do these more often in general. Um, they might just start being on Sundays. Maybe I could do one on Sunday. I don't know. That'd be good. Yeah, believing that we've improved and gotten better is something that is, especially if you live in places and, and grew up around societies, like I did, uh, here, where that's like very important to believe that things are better now than they were back then. It's very ingrained. If I come back on Sunday, what could I do? I think by then I need to be working on shoes for the next few days, but maybe, maybe come back to sewing on Sunday where instead of, no, I can't do Sunday because I have my, uh, I actually have a Patreon live on Sunday. Aha, that, that was why. I don't know. We'll look and I'll, I'll figure it out and I'll try and fit another one in. Um, oh, stretch my legs a little. I just don't use the thimble because I don't stitch in the way that needs it. Best place to buy corsets for historical ones is Red Threaded. Um, there are a whole bunch of modern ones out there. Like, there's so many, depending on what sort of quality you're looking for. Um, high quality dark garden. But I definitely have calluses. Um, I have a pretty big callus on that finger that you can see. <laughs> it's a little bit stained from some shoe um, stuff. But I have calluses on both of these fingers. Um, I definitely have cal like overall callus. It's not like a singular one, but just like very roughed. Um, but the these two fingers a lot. And then um, I have really big calluses usually right here. Um, this one in particular is really big because that's when I'm doing shoemaking you pull the threads <laughs> so I have a whole bunch a whole bunch of calluses yeah. turn on live stream put it on Bailey I could do that happy puppy time <laughs> but yeah I think I'm going to try to do more lives it may be on YouTube from time to time I may like I said I'm hoping to be able to do more maybe on Twitch, so there's more of a casual, like, just come hang out with me for three hours sort of nature to it. Um, and I don't have to clutter up the channel with a whole bunch. Uh, I think it's only two or three times so far on this live. Um, one of the videos I really want to do, uh, <laughs> which 
started off in one format and it's kind of like morphed into a different one because it started off like with talking about the rules that I break when it comes to sewing things that I was taught or seem to be the standard way of doing things that I don't think is the most effective. And then I began to realize all of those things developed um, from like the 1950s. So now it's become a, I want to do a video on how the 1950s ruined sewing um, or roughly thereabouts, but it'd probably just be that. Hi, Kate. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's aggressively large so I can see it. Don't worry. It's <laughs> it's for me as much as anyone else. So I don't miss it in the large all the things going by. Yeah, and I've done that I've done that with lives before. Um so we'll see. I'm gonna try some lives on Twitch probably early on in the year. We'll see how that goes. If that doesn't get much of a response, then I definitely will do more here. But there will be live somewhere. And I will always announce that. Um, if I start doing that on the regular, I'll try to announce on like the community section as well. So that way everybody can see it. Yeah, leather work I do sometimes use a thimble for, um, but I have variations. I have a weird accent, guys. <laughs> Sorry, I lived too many places as a child, and I ended up with some very strange accents. Um, there were definitely conversations as to like whether fancy ladies with calluses. Um, one of my favorite things that I've come across, and I need to find the original again, um, was of and it was satire, but I'm sure it had a lot of truth. Um, no, you do not need a Twitch account. Um, like, you don't have to do anything if you do it. But, uh, um, ah, words. <laughs> Brain restart. Um, calluses was that, uh, it was a father complaining about all these sort of hobbies that his daughters were picking up. And one of the things was shoemaking and how it, like, ruined their back and gave them calluses on their hands and all of that. So I'm sure the calluses were a thing to some extent. I mean, for goodness sakes, my first major like callus is the one that's like here, because um, that's where I rest my pencil and paintbrush and all of that. Um, but a lot of things that were considered, and I'm sure that's part of the reason why thimbles were a thing, was to prevent that. But a lot of things were considered more appropriate for women to do if they didn't have to contort their bodies or anything like that, like what sort of instruments or whatnot. I talk like you. <laughs> yeah, my, my accent is a weird combination of growing up in Chicago, D.C., um, with parents that were from neither area. <laughs> like, I know where my mother's accent is from, but my father's, I think he moved around too much. He's a military kid. Interestingly enough, I've been told by a few people who are like linguists and in a casual sense that some of my weird pronunciations for things, um, they don't know anybody who isn't like English as like a new language sort of situation where like English is not their first language. A lot of people pronounce it that way. So they, I've been told it was like a fascinating study because it's almost like, I think I learned a lot of language from reading. Like I read obsessively as a child, so that might be part of it that I say words like they're spelled more often. Um, but like, I've heard it, it's just, I'm not the best with like audio processing of language. So um, <laughs> I'm much better at, so I think it was one of those, oh, that's how you say that word, but it's never gonna be quite right. I used to get made fun of in high school a lot because I moved to a more rural area and everyone had a very similar way of speaking and yeah. Yeah, I, I have a pretty generic Midwestern accent to most people, but I have a few weird words here and there that are not correct. <laughs> No. 
I actually had to um, put a filter on my shoe video that went kind of viral um, because I kept getting comments on one particular word over and over and over again and somewhere around like the 100th comment I just it bothered like not like bothered bothered I was just like can we stop talking about this can we just <laughs> So I actually have that like flag so it doesn't show up until I go and I feel like I can go and approve it. Like I'm like, okay, I can talk about this right now sort of thing. So, um, and when I do like presentational, like talking to a group, I had a lot of people at Williamsburg who asked me if I had like, oh, are you trying to do like a British accent or something? I'm like, nope. I also find it weird when people talk about like Bernadette's accent because I lived in the area where she's from for a lot of years um, and my stepsister grew up there um, and there's a lot of similarities in the accents because she also spent, she, she's in Europe now. Um, so it's just like, I find it very weird that there's actually like an overlap there. Okay, so we've got that in. That looks pretty on the outside of pressing, it'll do really well. And then it's time to put in some pocketing. Oh yeah, I <laughs> I am definitely somewhere in the um, neurodivergent range and will definitely 100% pick up accents um, based on what I'm Part of that is also because I moved so much as a kid, it was a necessary thing to do for survival. Otherwise I got made fun of a lot. So, um, and I watched a lot of old movies. And so I picked up weird things there and I read a lot. So I, I pronounce things really for that reason. So I've got a weird assortment of sources for my accent, um, just because of the type of people I was around and all that. So yeah, which is why I'm like, Generally, I tell people, like, avoid commenting on other people's accents because you never know what sort of trauma that accent actually carries for people. I have definitely come to that conclusion for me. Like, I, I carry a lot of, I don't know, trauma with accents and fitting in or not fitting in or having people bully you over it. Especially if you move around a lot as a kid, it becomes a source of bullying. So... Okay, so the next step I'm going to do is to lay this pocketing in and I'm going to fell it down on this side and then it will connect to the other side of the open wall. So this is like basically a giant welt, which has been a really interesting way for me to think about what looks like a very complex pocket, but I do need to put the buttonhole in this before I close it up because it'll be much easier to do after I get this step in. I should have done that. That would have been more fun to show. It will. So that will get stitched in there. And then I will fold this back over so it sort of matches up. And then the pocket will come across and get stitched to that part of the opening. So that will get folded back and stitched to the pocketing and then we'll have a complete pocket from the outside. So that's where I'm headed next, which is again, just more of the same seeming. Like I feel like at this point, I'm like, I've just done that. But like the cool thing for me is this, this soutache braid that I've been experimenting with. So I think that's gonna make this coat look really fancy in a way. So I'm excited about that. Um, but this gives me a very good start, whatever's happening there. And I'll get the pocket in and I'll get the sink. There's one buttonhole. Um, this over so you can see what it looks like from the exterior. Um, so there's one buttonhole right about there. Just one little button for those front pockets, which will probably never be buttoned in my case because I'll just constantly be getting in and out of my pockets. Um, but this is the center front here. So it closes over and you have the two pockets on either side. So. Oh yeah, definitely. I have a, a good friend whose mother is English um, and she grew up in America so she ended up with some very interesting things and her vocab and pronunciation, which is always adorable. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm not doing a full gonzo. Like, I'm not doing the nose and all the crazy furry whateverness. Um, sorry. <laughs> I will be doing one one sort of uh, tribute to, but um, I won't be doing. I've I've painted myself fully blue before um, for Lore Olympus um, cosplay, and I'm I'm good with not doing that again. <laughs> I've done it twice now. I'm good with not doing. <laughs> Like, even though I know how to do it better now and could definitely get better things. Um, but. Hmm. Yeah, I've, I've always been interested in accent stuff. Um, just because I have such a weird assortment of one. I love doing those quiz things. Of like, where are you from? Let's find out. I'm like, you will never know. Usually it comes up with something completely incorrect. <laughs> like, ah, no one knows. Um. Um, I generally go by she, her, but I am totally fine. I've had, I've had some people ask me about that and like, I'm totally fine with they, them as well. Um, someone, for me, most of the time, it's just what I wake up that day feeling or what situation I'm in. Like, I definitely realized, um, years ago, like being on the internet as non-gendered, um, was a much more enjoyable process in certain areas. Like when I did his uh, ask historians on Reddit, uh, which I still love going back into. I just don't have the time to do anymore. Um, but I specifically chose a non-gendered name and man, did that make my life better. As I started realizing like that was, I, I like that sometimes. Like sometimes I just don't, I just don't want to deal with it. I just don't. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I'm cool with either. And most of the time for me, it's just, what, what, how do I look, feel, act that day? Um, the one time, <laughs> like, I, when I put on men's clothing, I don't try to usually present super masculine. Um, the one time that I specifically did that, though, was when I did the Lazlo cosplay with Abby and freaked everyone out. It was so good. Oh, that was one of the most, and like, <laughs> I was like, this was fun. I made a lot of people very uncomfortable on, like, different levels. Um, one, one friend was like, I can't, I am, you're sitting correctly and this makes me deeply uncomfortable. <laughs> like just, this was not, I'm having trouble processing this. It's like, then I did it well. <laughs> um, so I, I don't know, I, that like spending a lot of time watching people and trying to understand what we identify as one thing or the other. Yeah, I've been trying to figure out something with a chicken or something, but there's also, like, I know that there are chickens kind of vaguely in the movie, but not, like, the, the gonzo chicken thing is not, like, accentuated in the movie, so. Um, I don't know, maybe, I don't think I have any penguin stuff either anymore. There are penguins in the movie. <laughs> so, okay, guys, well, it's been almost three hours, so I should probably wrap things up. We now have something akin to the beginnings of A Nice Pocket, which took me longer than it should have. Um, but stopping and reading while I'm doing this is, <laughs> makes it kind of slow. Um, so yeah, but that's the beginning of the right side of the skirt. And it'll, it'll come together really fast. Like the pockets are the only complicated bit in this. I don't even have a lot of pad stitching to do. Um, like I did with the last one. There'll be a little bit in the collar, but not in the lapels. So we'll see how far I get. Maybe I'll do another live. It might be on Sunday, because I might might do... Mm, if I do Patreon in like the morning, and then something here in the afternoon. We'll see. We'll see what I'm doing. I don't know. But happy holidays to everybody. Whatever holidays you're celebrating, whatever type of thing it is, um... Doesn't matter, the point is to eat food and enjoy company. <laughs> Hang out with some friends, um, go burn some things. I don't know, whatever you feel you need to to get yourself through the end of another stressful year and into the next one prepared well for whatever comes your way. I am definitely glad um, to be like getting ready to wrap this up and start fresh at the beginning of the year. Like finishing up this big project right in the beginning of January will feel good. And then like launching into whatever's next, the cruise stuff will be a big one. I got a lot of stuff to make for that. Um, but I have a lot of other things I want to do too. So yeah, but see you guys. Bye.